Diodorus Siculus. Library of History. Book 5, Beginning. It should be the special care of historians, when they compose their works, to give attention to everything which may be of utility, and especially to the arrangement of the varied material they present. This eye to arrangement, for instance, is not only of great help to persons in the disposition of their private affairs if they would preserve and increase their property, but also, when men come to writing history, it offers them not a few advantages. Some historians indeed, although they are worthy objects of praise in the matter of style and in the breadth of experience derived from the events which they record, have nevertheless fallen short in respect of the way in which they have handled the matter of arrangement, with the result that, whereas the effort and care which they expended received the approbation of their readers, yet the order which they gave to the material they have recorded is the object of just censure. Timius, for example, bestowed. It is true the greatest attention upon the precision of his chronology and had due regard for the breadth of knowledge gained through experience, but he is criticised with good reason for his untimely and lengthy censures, and because of the excess to which he went in censuring he historian given by some men the name Epitimius or censurer. Ephrus, on the other hand, in the universal history which he composed has achieved success, not alone in the style of his composition, but also as regards the arrangement of his work, for each one of his books is so constructed as to embrace events which fall under a single topic. Consequently we also have given our preference to this method of handling our material, and, in so far as it is possible, are adhering to this general principle. And since we have given this book the title On the Islands, in accordance with this heading the first island we shall speak about will be Sicily. Since it is both the richest of the islands and holds first place in respect of the great age of the myths related concerning it. The island in ancient times was called, after its shape, Trinacria, then Sicania after the Sicani who made their home there, and finally it has been given the name Sicily after the Sicilii who crossed over in a body to it from Italy. Its circumference is some 4,360 stards, for of its three sides, that extending from Polorius to Lilibium is 1,700 stards. That from Lilibium to Pachinus in the territory of Syracuse is 1,500, and the remaining side is 1,140 stards. The Siciliati who dwell in the island have received the tradition from their ancestors, the report having ever been handed down successively from earliest time by one generation to the next, that the island is sacred to Demeter and Kor, although there are certain poets who recount the myth that at the marriage of Pluton and Persephone Zeus gave this island as a wedding present to the bride. That the ancient inhabitants of Sicily, the Sicani, were indigenous, is stated by the best authorities among historians, also that the goddesses we have mentioned first made their appearance on this island, and that it was the first, because of the fertility of the soil, to bring forth the fruit of the corn, facts to which the most renowned of the poets also bears witness when he writes. But all these things grow there for them unsown. Anine and tilled, both wheat and barley, yeah. And vines, which yield such wine as fine grapes give and reign of Zeus gives increase unto them. Indeed, in the plain of Leontini, we are told, and throughout many other parts of Sicily the wheat men called wild grows even to this day. And, speaking generally, before the corn was discovered, if one were to raise the question, what manner of land it was of the inhabited earth where the fruit we have mentioned appeared for the first time, the mead of honour may reasonably be accorded to the richest land, and in keeping with what we have stated, it is also to be observed that the goddesses who made this discovery are those who receive the highest honours among the Siciliati. Again, the fact that the rape of Cor took place in Sicily is, men say, proof most evident that the goddesses made this island their favourite retreat because it was cherished by them before all others. And the rape of Cor, the myth relates, took place in the meadows in the territory of Enna. The spot lies near the city, a place of striking beauty for its violets and every other kind of flower, and worthy of the goddess. And the story is told that, because of the sweet odour of the flowers growing there, trained hunting dogs are unable to hold the trail, because their natural sense of smell is balked. A. And the meadow we have mentioned is level in the centre and well watered throughout, but on its periphery it rises high and falls off with precipitous cliffs on every side. And it is conceived of as lying in the very centre of the island, which is the reason why certain writers call it the navel of Sicily. Near to it also are sacred groves, surrounded by marshy flats, and a huge grotto which contains a chasm which leads down into the earth and opens to the north, and through it, the myth relates, Pluton, coming out with his chariot, effected the rape of Kor. And the violets, we are told, and the rest of the flowers which supply the sweet odour continue to bloom, to one's amazement, 
throughout the entire year, and so the whole aspect of the place is one of flowers and delight. And both Athena and Artemis, the myth goes on to say, who had made the same choice of maidenhood as had Kor and were reared together with her, joined with her in gathering the flowers, and all of them together wove the robe for their father Zeus. And because of the time they had spent together and their intimacy, they all loved this island above any other, and each one of them received for her portion a territory, Athena receiving hers in the region of Himera, where the nymphs, to please Athena, caused the springs of warm water to gush forth on the occasion of the visit of Heracles to the island, and the natives consecrated a city to her, and a plot of ground which to this day is called Athena's. And Artemis received from the gods the island at Syracuse, which was named after her, by both the oracles and men, or Tidja. On this island likewise these nymphs, to please Artemis, caused a great fountain to gush forth to which was given the name Arethusa. And not only in ancient times did this fountain contain large fish in great numbers, but also in our own day we find these fish still there, considered to be holy and not to be touched by men, and on many occasions, when certain men have eaten them amid stress of war, the deity has shown a striking sign, and has visited with great sufferings such as dared to take them for food. B of these matters, we shall give an exact account in connection with the appropriate period of time. Like the two goddesses whom we have mentioned Kor, we are told, received as her portion the meadows round about Enna, but a great fountain was made sacred to her in the territory of Syracuse and given the name Syene or Tasia Fount. For the myth relates that it was near Syracuse that Plutarch effected the rape of Kor and took her away in his chariot, and that after cleaving the earth asunder he himself descended into Hades, taking along with him the bride whom he had seized, and that he caused the fountain named Syene to gush forth, near which the Syracusans each year hold a notable festive gathering. And private individuals offer the lesser victims, but when the ceremony is on behalf of the community, bulls are plunged in the pool, this manner of sacrifice having been commanded by Heracles on the occasion when he made the circuit of all Sicily, while driving off the cattle of Geriones. After the rape of Kor, the myth does on to recount, Demeter, being unable to find her daughter, kindled torches in the craters of Mount. Etna and visited many parts of the inhabited world, and upon the men who received her with the greatest favour she conferred briefs, rewarding them with the gift of the fruit of the wheat. And since a more kindly welcome was extended the goddess by the Athenians than by any other people, they were the first after the Siceliati to be given the fruit of the wheat, and in return for this gift the citizens of that city in assembly honoured the goddess above all others with the establishment both of most notable sacrifices and of the mysteries of Eleusis, which, by reason of their very great antiquity and sanctity, have come to be famous among all mankind. From the Athenians many peoples received a portion of the gracious gift of the corn, and they in turn, sharing the gift of the seed with their neighbours. In this way caused all the inhabited world to abound with it. And the inhabitants of Sicily, since by reason of the intimate relationship of Demeter and Kor with them they were the first to share in the corn after its discovery, instituted to each one of the goddesses sacrifices and festive gatherings, which they named after them, and by the time chosen for these made acknowledgement of the gifts which had been conferred upon them. In the case of Kor, for instance, they established the celebration of her return at about the time when the fruit of the corn was found to come to maturity, and they celebrate this sacrifice and festive gathering with such strictness of observance and such zeal as we should reasonably expect those men to show who are returning thanks for having been selected before all mankind for the greatest possible gift. But in the case of Demeter they preferred that time for the sacrifice when the sowing of the corn is first begun. And for a period of ten days they hold a festive gathering, which bears the name of this goddess and is most magnificent by reason of the brilliance of their preparation for it. While in the observance of it they imitate the ancient manner of life. And it is their custom during these days to indulge in coarse language as they associate one with another, the reason being that by such coarseness the goddess, grieved though she was at the rape of Kor, burst into laughter. That the rape of Kor took place in the manner we have described is attested by many ancient historians and poets. Carcinus the tragic poet, for instance, who often visited in Syracuse and witnessed the zeal which the inhabitants displayed in the sacrifices and festive gatherings for both Demeter and Kor, has the following verses in his writings, Demeter's daughter, her whom none may name. By secret schemings Plutan, men say, stole. And then he dropped into earth's depths, whose light is darkness. Longing for the vanished girl her mother searched and visited all lands in turn and Sicily's land by Etna's crags was filled with streams of fire which no man could approach, and groaned throughout its length, in grief over the maiden now the folk, beloved of Zeus, was perishing without the corn. 
Hence honor they these goddesses e'en now. But we should not omit to mention the very great benefaction which Demeter conferred upon mankind, for beside the fact that she was the discoverer of corn, she also taught mankind how to prepare it for food and introduced laws by obedience to which men became accustomed to the practice of justice, this being the reason, we are told, why she has been given the epithet Thesmophoros or lawgiver. Surely a benefaction greater than these discoveries of hers one could not find, for they embrace both living and living honorably. However, as for the myths which are current among the Siceliati, we shall be satisfied with what has been said. We must now write briefly about the Sicani who were the first inhabitants of Sicily, in view of the fact that certain historians are not in agreement about this people. Philistus, for instance, says that they removed from Iberia and settled the island, having got the name they bore from a certain river in Iberia named Sicanus, but Timius adduces proof of the ignorance of this historian and correctly declares that they were indigenous, and in asthmach as the evidences he offers of the antiquity of this people are many, we think that there is no need for us to recount them. The Sicani, then, originally made their homes in villages, building their settlements upon the strongest hills because of the pirates, for they had not yet been brought under the single rule of a king, but in each settlement there was one man who was lord and at first they made their home in every part of the island and secured their food by tilling the land, but at a later time. When Edna sent up volcanic eruptions in an increasing number of places and a great torrent of lava was poured forth over the land, it came to pass that a great stretch of the country was ruined. And since the fire kept consuming a large area of the land during an increasing number of years, in fear they left the eastern parts of Sicily and removed to the western. And last of all, Many generations later, the people of the Sicilii crossed over in a body from Italy into Sicily and made their home in the land which had been abandoned by the Sicani. And since the Sicilii steadily grew more avaricious and kept ravaging the land which bordered on theirs, frequent wars arose between them and the Sicani, until at last they struck covenants and set up boundaries, upon which they had agreed, for the territory. With regard to the Sicani, we shall give a detailed account in connection with the appropriate period of time. The colonies of the Greeks, and notable ones they were, were the last to be made in Sicily, and their cities were founded on the sea. All the inhabitants mingled with one another, and since the Greeks came to the island in great numbers, the natives learned their speech, and then, having been brought up in the Greek ways of life, they lost in the end their barbarian speech as well as their name, all of them being called Siciliati. But since we have spoken about these matters at sufficient length, we shall turn our discussion to the islands known as the Eolids. These islands are seven in number and bear the following names, Strangile, Euonymus, Didyme, Phenicodes, Ericodes, Hyera Hephaestu, and Lypra, on which is situated a city of the same name. They lie between Sicily and Italy in a straight line from the strait, extending from east to west. They are about 150 stards distant from Sicily and are all of about the same size, and the largest one of them is about 150 stards in circumference. All of them have experienced great volcanic eruptions, and the resulting craters and openings may be seen to this day. On Strangile and Hyera even at the present time there are sent forth from the open mouths great exhalations accompanied by an enormous roaring, and sand and a multitude of red-hot stones are erupted, as may also be seen taking place on Etna. The reason is. As some say, that passages lead under the earth from these islands to Etna, and are connected with the openings at both ends of them, and this is why the craters on these islands usually alternate in activity with those of Etna. We are told that the islands of Elis were uninhabited in ancient times, but that later Lyprus, as he was called, the son of Orson the king, was overcome by his brothers who rebelled against him, and securing some warships and soldiers he fled from Italy to the island, which received the name Lypra after him. On it he founded the city which bears his name and brought under cultivation the other islands mentioned before. And when Lyprus had already come to old age, Aeolus, the son of Hippotes, came to Lypra with certain companions and married Syene, the daughter of Lyprus, and after he had formed a government in which his followers and the natives shared equally, he became king over the island. To Lyprus, who had a longing for Italy, Aeolus gave his aid in securing for him the regions about Sorrentum where he became king and, after winning great esteem, ended his days, and after he had been accorded a magnificent funeral he received at the hands of the natives honours equal to those offered to the heroes. This is the heirless to whom, the myth relates, Odysseus came in the course of his wanderings. He was, they say, pious and just and kindly as well in his treatment of strangers, furthermore, 
he introduced seafarers to the use of sails and had learned, by long observation of what the fire foretold, to predict with accuracy the local winds, this being the reason why the myth has referred to him as the keeper of the winds, and it was because of his very great piety that he was called a friend of the gods. To Elus, we are told, sons were born to the number of six, Astiochus, Zuthus, and Androcles, and Phoremon, Jocastus, and Agathernus, and they every one received great approbation both because of the fame of their father and because of their own high achievements. Of their number Jocastus held fast to Italy and was king of the coast as far as the regions about Regium, but Phoremon and Androcles were lords over Sicily from the strait as far as the regions about Lilibium. Of this country the parts to the east were inhabited by Siculi and those to the west by Sicuni. These two peoples quarrelled with each other, but they rendered obedience of their own free will to the sons of Aeolus, we have mentioned, both because of the piety of their father Aeolus, which was famed afar, and because of the fair dealing of the sons themselves. Zuthus was king over the land in the neighbourhood of Leontini, which is known after him as Zuthia to this day. Agathernus. Becoming king of the land now called Agathernitis. Founded a city which was called after him Agathernus, and Astiochus secured the lordship over Lypra. All these men followed the example which their father had set for both piety and justice and hence were accorded great approbation. Their descendants succeeded to their thrones over many generations, but in the end the kings of the house of Aeolus were overthrown throughout Sicily. After this the Siculi put the leadership in each case in the hands of the ablest man, but the Siculi quarrelled over the lordship and warred against each other during a long period of time. But many years later than these events, when the islands again were becoming steadily more destitute of inhabitants, certain men of Nidus and Rhodes, being aggrieved at the harsh treatment they were receiving at the hands of the kings of Asia, resolved to send out a colony. Consequently, having chosen for their leader Pentathlus of Nidus, who traced his ancestry back to Hippotes, who was a descendant of Heracles, in the course of the 50th Olympiad, that in which Epitelidas of Sparta won the Stadion, these settlers, then, of the company of Pentathlus sailed to Sicily to the regions about Lilibium, where they found the inhabitants of Egesta and of Salinas at war with one another. And being persuaded by the men of Salinas to take their side in the war, they suffered heavy losses in the battle, Pentathlus himself being among those who fell. Consequently the survivors, since the men of Salinas had been defeated in the war, decided to return to their homes. And choosing for leaders Gorgas and the Rista and Epithersides, who were relatives of Pentathlus, they sailed off through the Tyrrhenian Sea. But when they put in at Lypra and received a kindly reception, they were prevailed upon to make common cause with the inhabitants of Lypra in forming a single community there, since of the colony of Aeolus there remained only about 500 men. At a later time, because they were being harassed by the Tyrrheni who were carrying on piracy on the sea, they fitted out a fleet and divided themselves into two bodies, one of which took over the cultivation of the islands which they had made the common property of the community, whereas the other was to fight the pirates, their possessions also they made common property, and living according to the public mess system. See, they passed their lives in this communistic fashion for some time. At a later time they apportioned among themselves the island of Lypra, where their city also lay, but cultivated the other islands in common. And in the final stage, they divided all the islands among themselves for a period of twenty years. And then they cast lots for them again at every expiration of this period. After effecting this organization they defeated the Tyrrhenians in many sea fights, and from their booty they often made notable dedications of a tenth part, which they sent to Delphi. It remains for us now, as regards the city of the Liparians, to give an explanation of the causes why in later times it grew to a position, not only of prosperity, but even of renown. These, then, are the reasons, the city is adorned by nature with excellent harbours and springs of warm water which are famed far and wide, for not only do the baths there contribute greatly to the healing of the sick, but they also, in keeping with the peculiar property of such warm springs, provide pleasure and enjoyment of no ordinary kind. Consequently many people throughout Sicily who are afflicted by illnesses of a peculiar nature come to the city and by taking the baths regain their health in a marvellous manner. And this island contains the far-famed mines of styptic earth, from which the Liparians and Romans derive great revenues. For since styptic earth is found nowhere else in the inhabited world and is of great usefulness, it stands to reason that, because they enjoy a monopoly of it and can raise the price, they should get an unbelievable amount of money, for on the island of Melos alone is there found a deposit of styptic earth, 
but a small one, which cannot suffice for many cities. The island of the Liparians is also small in extent, but sufficiently fruitful and, so far as the wants of men are concerned, it supports even a high degree of luxury. For it supplies the inhabitants with a multitude of fish of every kind and contains those fruit trees which can offer the most pleasure when one enjoys them. But as regards Lipra and the rest of the islands of Aeolus, as they are called, we shall be satisfied with what has been said. Beyond Lipra, toward the west, lies an island in the open sea which is small in extent and uninhabited and bears the name Osteodes because of the following strange occurrence. During the time when the Carthaginians were waging many great wars with the Syracusans, they were employing notable forces on both land and sea, and on the occasion in question they had many mercenaries who were gathered from every people, such troops are always troublemakers and make it their practice to cause many and serious mutinies, especially on occasions when they do not get their pay promptly, and at the time of which we are speaking they practiced their accustomed knavishness and audacity. For being in number about six thousand and not receiving their pay, they at first massed together and invade against the generals, and since the latter were without funds and time after time kept deferring payment, they threatened that they would take up arms and wreak vengeance upon the Carthaginians. And they even laid violent hands upon the commanders. Though the Senate admonished them, the quarrel always blazed forth the more, whereupon the Senate gave secret orders to the generals to do away with all the recalcitrants, and the generals then, acting upon the commands, embarked the mercenaries upon ships and sailed off as if upon some mission of war. And putting in at the island we have mentioned they disembarked all the mercenaries upon it and then sailed away, leaving the recalcitrants upon the island. The mercenaries, being in deep distress at the condition in which they found themselves, and yet unable to wreak vengeance upon the Carthaginians, perished from hunger. And since it was a small island on which so many confined men died, it came to pass that the place, little as it was, was filled with their bones, and this is the reason why the island received the name it bears. In this way, then, did the mercenaries, who were guilty of crime in the manner we have described, suffer the greatest misfortune. Perishing for lack of food. But for our part, since we have set forth the facts concerning the islands of the Aeolids, we shall consider it appropriate to make mention in turn of the islands, which lie on the other side. For off the south of Sicily three islands lie out in the sea, and each of them possesses a city and harbours, which can offer safety to ships which are in stress of weather. The first one is that called Malite, which lies about 800 stards from Syracuse, and it possesses many harbours which offer exceptional advantages, and its inhabitants are blessed in their possessions, for it has artisans skilled in every manner of craft, the most important being those who weave linen, which is remarkably sheer and soft, and the dwellings on the island are worthy of note, being ambitiously constructed with cornices and finished in stucco with unusual workmen. Ship this island is a colony planted by the Phoenicians, who, as they extended their trade to the western ocean, found in it a place of safe retreat. Since it was well supplied with harbours and lay out in the open sea, and this is the reason why the inhabitants of this island, since they received assistance in many respects through the sea merchants, shot up quickly in their manner of living and increased in renown. After this island there is a second which bears the name of Gaulus, lying out in the open sea and adorned with well-situated harbours, a Phoenician colony. Next comes Circena, facing Libya, which has a modest city and most serviceable harbours, which have accommodations not only for merchant vessels but even for ships of war. But now that we have spoken of the islands which are to the south of Sicily, we shall turn back to those which follow upon Lipera and lie in the sea which is known as the Tyrrhenian. Off the city of Tyrrhenia known as Poplonim, there is an island which men call Ethalia. It is about 100 stards distant from the coast and received the name it bears from the smoke, eight halos, which lies so thick about it. For the island possesses a great amount of iron rock, which they quarry in order to melt and cast and thus to secure the iron, and they possess a great abundance of this ore. For those who are engaged in the working of this or crush the rock and burn the lumps which have thus been broken in certain ingenious furnaces, and in these they smelt the lumps by means of a great fire and form them into pieces of moderate size which are in their appearance like large sponges. These are purchased by merchants in exchange either for money or for goods and are then taken to Dikiakia or the other trading stations, where there are men who purchase such cargoes and who, with the aid of a multitude of artisans in metal whom they have collected, Work it further and manufacture iron objects of every description. 
Some of these are worked into the shape of armor, and others are ingeniously fabricated into shapes well suited for two pronged forks and sickles and other such tools, and these are then carried by merchants to every region, and thus many parts of the inhabited world have a share in the usefulness which accrues from them. After Ethalia, there is an island, some 300 stards distant, which is called Cernus by the Greeks, but Corsica by the Romans and those who dwell upon it. This island, being easy to land on, has a most excellent harbour, which is called Syracosium. There are also on it two notable cities, the one being known as Calaris and the other as Nicaea. Calaris was founded by Phocians, who made their home there for a time and were then driven out of the island by Tyrrhenians, but Nicaea was founded by Tyrrhenians at the time they were masters of the sea and were taking possession of the islands lying off Tyrrhenia. They were lords of the cities of Cernus for a considerable period and exacted tribute of the inhabitants in the form of resin, wax, and honey, since these things were found in the island in abundance. Slaves from Cernus are reputed to be superior to all others for every service which the life of man demands, nature herself giving them this characteristic. And the entire island, which is of great extent, has mountainous land over much of its area, which is thickly covered with continuous forests and traversed by small rivers. The inhabitants of Cernus use for their food milk and honey and meat, the land providing all these in abundance, and among themselves they live lives of honour and justice, to a degree surpassing practically all other barbarians. Any honeycomb, for instance, which may be found in the trees on the mountainside belongs to the first man to find it, no one disputing his claim, their cattle are distinguished by brands, and even though no man may watch over them, they are still kept safe for their owners, and in their other ways of living one and all it is astonishing how they revere our brightness before everything else. But the most amazing thing which takes place among them is connected with the birth of their children, for when the wife is about to give birth she is the object of no concern as regards her delivery, but it is her husband who takes to his bed, as though sick, and he practices kuvard for a specified number of days, feigning that his body is in pain. There also grows in this island boxwood in great abundance and of excellent quality and it is due to it that the honey of the island is altogether bitter. And the island is inhabited by barbarians who have a language which is different from others and hard to understand, and they are in number more than thirty thousand. Adjoining Cernus is an island which is called Sardinia, and in size it is about the equal of Sicily and is inhabited by barbarians who bear the name of Iolas and are thought to be descendants of the men who settled there along with Iolaus and the Thespiadae for at the time when Heracles was accomplishing his famous labours he had many sons by the daughters of this pious, and these Heracles dispatched to Sardinia, in accordance with a certain oracle, sending along with them a notable force composed of both Greeks and barbarians, in order to plant a colony. Iolaus, the nephew of Heracles, was in charge of the undertaking. And taking possession of the island he founded in it notable cities, and when he had divided the land into allotments he called the folk of the colony Iolas after himself, and he also constructed gymnasia and temples to the gods and everything else which contributes to making happy the life of man, memorials of this remaining even to this day, since the fairest plains there derive their name from him and are called Iolia, and the whole body of the people preserve to the present the name which they took from Iolaus. Now the oracle regarding the colony contained also the promise that the participants in this colony should maintain their freedom for all time, and it has indeed come to pass that the oracle, contrary to what one would expect, has preserved autonomy for the natives unshaken to this day. Thus the Carthaginians, though their power extended far and they subdued the island, were not able to enslave its former possessors, but the Iolas fled for safety to the mountainous part of the island and built underground dwellings, and here they raised many flocks and herds which supplied them with food in abundance, so that they were able to maintain themselves on a diet of milk and cheese and meat, and since they had retired from the plain country, they avoided the hardship which accompanies labour, but ranged over the mountainous part of the island and led a life which had no share in hardship, in that they continued to use the foods mentioned above. And although the Carthaginians made war upon them many times with considerable armies, yet because of the rugged nature of the country and the difficulty of dealing with their dugout dwellings the people remained unenslaved. Last of all, when the Romans conquered the island and oftentimes made war on them, they remained unsubbed by the troops of an enemy for the reasons we have mentioned. In the early period, however, Iolaus, after helping to establish the affairs of the colony, returned to Greece, but the Thespiadae were the chief men of the island for many generations, until finally they were driven out into Italy, where they settled in the region of Syme, the mass of the colonists who were left behind became barbarized, 
and choosing the best among the natives to be their chieftains, they have maintained their freedom down to our own day. But now that we have spoken about Sardinia at sufficient length, we shall discuss the islands in the order in which they lie. After those we have mentioned there comes first an island called Pitusa, the name being due to the multitude of pine trees, pitties, which grow throughout it. It lies out in the open sea, and is distant from the pillars of Heracles a voyage of three days, and as many nights, from Libya a day, and a night, and from Iberia one day, and in size it is about as large as Corsera. The island is only moderately fertile, possessing little land that is suitable for the vine, but it has olive trees which are engrafted upon the wild olive. And of all the products of the island, they say that the softness of its wool stands first in excellence. The island is broken up at intervals by notable plains and highlands and has a city named Eresus, a colony of the Carthaginians. And it also possesses excellent harbours, huge walls, and a multitude of well-constructed houses. Its inhabitants consist of barbarians of every nationality, but Phoenicians preponderate. The date of the founding of the colony falls 160 years after the settlement of Carthage. There are other islands lying opposite Iberia, which the Greeks call Gymnesii because the inhabitants go naked, gymnoi, of clothing in the summer time, but which the inhabitants of the islands and the Romans call Balurides, because in the hurling, bulline, of large stones with slings the natives are the most skillful of all men. The larger of these is the largest of all islands after the seven, Sicily, Sardinia, Cyprus, Crete, Euboea, Cernus, and Lesbos, and it is a day's voyage distant from Iberia. The smaller lies more to the east and maintains great droves and flocks of every kind of animal, especially of mules, which stand very high and are exceptionally strong. Both islands have good land which produces fruits, and a multitude of inhabitants numbering more than 30,000, but as for their food products they raise no wine whatsoever. Consequently, the inhabitants are one and all exceedingly addicted to indulgence in wine because of the scarcity of it among them and they are altogether lacking in olive oil and therefore prepare an oil from the mastic tree, which they mix with the fat from pigs, and with this they anoint their bodies. The Baleares are of all men the most fond of women and value them so highly above everything else that, when any of their women are seized by visiting pirates and carried off, they will give as ransom for a single woman three and even four men. Their dwellings they make under hollow rocks, or they dig out holes along the faces of sharp crags, in general putting many parts of them underground, and in these they pass their time, having an eye both to the shelter and to the safety which such homes afford. Silver and gold money is not used by them at all, and as a general practice its importation into the island is prevented, the reason they offer being that of old Heracles made an expedition against Geriones, who was the son of Chrysae and possessed both silver and gold in abundance. Consequently, in order that their possession should consist in that against which no one would have designs, they have made wealth in gold and silver alien from themselves. And so, in keeping this decision of theirs, when in early times they served once in the campaigns of the Carthaginians, they did not bring back their pay to their native land, but spent it all upon the purchase of women and wine. The Baleares have also an amazing custom which they observe in connection with their marriages, for during their wedding festivities the relatives and friends lie with the bride in turn, the oldest first and then the next oldest and the rest in order, and the last one to enjoy this privilege is the bridegroom. Peculiar also and altogether strange is their practice regarding the burial of the dead, for they dismember the body with wooden knives, and then they place the pieces in a jar and pile upon it a heap of stones. Their equipment for fighting consists of three slings, and of these they keep one around the head, another around the belly, and the third in the hands. In the business of war they hurl much larger stones than do any other slingers, and with such force that the missile seems to have been shot, as it were, from a catapult, Consequently, in their assaults upon walled cities, they strike the defenders on the battlements and disable them, and in pitched battles they crush both shields and helmets and every kind of protective armour. And they are so accurate in their aim that in the majority of cases they never miss the target before them. The reason for this is the continual practice which they get from childhood, in that their mothers compel them, while still young boys, to use the sling continually, for there is set up before them as a target a piece of bread fastened to a stake, and the novice is not permitted to eat until he has hit the bread, whereupon he takes it from his mother with her permission and devours it. But now that we have discussed what relates to the islands, which lie within the pillars of Heracles, we shall give an account of those which are in the ocean.
for there lies out in the deep off Libya an island of considerable size, and situated as it is in the ocean it is distant from Libya a voyage of a number of days to the west. Its land is fruitful, much of it being mountainous and not a little being a level plain of surpassing beauty. Through it flow navigable rivers which are used for irrigation, and the island contains many parks planted with trees of every variety and gardens in great multitudes which are traversed by streams of sweet water, on it also are private villas of costly construction, and throughout the gardens banqueting houses have been constructed in a setting of flowers, and in them the inhabitants pass their time during the summer season, since the land supplies in abundance everything which contributes to enjoyment and luxury. The mountainous part of the island is covered with dense thickets of great extent and with fruit trees of every variety. And, inviting men to life among the mountains, it has cozy glens and springs in great number. In a word, this island is well supplied with springs of sweet water which not only makes the use of it enjoyable for those who pass their life there but also contribute to the health and vigour of their bodies. There is also excellent hunting of every manner of beast and wild animal, and the inhabitants, being well supplied with this game at their feasts, lack of nothing which pertains to luxury and extravagance, for in fact the sea which washes the shore of the island contains a multitude of fish, since the character of the ocean is such that it abounds throughout its extent with fish of every variety. And, speaking generally, the climate of the island is so altogether mild that it produces in abundance the fruits of the trees and the other seasonal fruits for the larger part of the year, so that it would appear that the island, because of its exceptional felicity, were a dwelling place of a race of gods and not of men. In ancient times this island remained undiscovered because of its distance from the entire inhabited world, but it was discovered at a later period for the following reason. The Phoenicians, who from ancient times on made voyages continually for purposes of trade, planted many colonies throughout Libya and not a few as well in the western parts of Europe. And since their ventures turned out according to their expectations, they amassed great wealth and essayed to voyage beyond the pillars of Heracles into the sea which men call the ocean. And, first of all, upon the strait itself by the pillars they founded a city on the shores of Europe, and since the land formed a peninsula they called the city Gadira, in the city they built many works appropriate to the nature of the region, and among them a costly temple of Heracles, and they instituted magnificent sacrifices which were conducted after the manner of the Phoenicians. And it has come to pass that this shrine has been held in an honour beyond the ordinary, both at the time of its building and in comparatively recent days down even to our own lifetime. Also many Romans, distinguished men who have performed great deeds, have offered vows to this god, and these vows they have performed after the completion of their successes. The Phoenicians, then, while exploring the coast outside the pillars for the reasons we have stated and while sailing along the shore of Libya, were driven by strong winds a great distance out into the ocean and after being storm-tossed for many days they were carried ashore on the island we mentioned above, and when they had observed its felicity and nature they caused it to be known to all men. Consequently the Tyrrhenians, at the time when they were masters of the sea, purposed to dispatch a colony to it, but the Carthaginians prevented their doing so, partly out of concern lest many inhabitants of Carthage should remove there because of the excellence of the island and partly in order to have ready in it a place in which to seek refuge against an incalculable turn of fortune in case some total disaster should overtake Carthage. For it was their thought that, since they were masters of the sea, they would thus be able to move, households and all, to an island which was unknown to their conquerors. But since we have set forth the facts concerning the ocean lying off Libya and its islands, we shall now turn our discussion to Europe. Opposite that part of Gaul, which lies on the ocean and directly across from the Hercynian forest, as it is called, which is the largest of any in Europe of which tradition tells us, there are many islands out in the ocean of which the largest is that known as Britain. In ancient times this island remained unvisited by foreign armies, for neither Dionys, tradition tells us, nor Heracles, nor any other hero or leader made a campaign against it, in our day. However, Gaius Caesar, who has been called a god because of his deeds, was the first man of whom we have record to have conquered the island, and after subduing the Britons he compelled them to pay fixed tributes. But we shall give a detailed account of the events of this conquest in connection with the appropriate period of time, and at present we shall discuss the island and the tin which is found in it. Britain is triangular in shape, very much as is Sicily, but its sides are not equal. This island stretches obliquely along the coast of Europe, and the point where it is least distant from the mainland, we are told, is the promontory which men call Cantium, and this is about 100 stards from the land, at the place where the sea has its outlet, 
whereas the second promontory, known as Balirium, is said to be a voyage of four days from the mainland, and the last, writers tell us, extends out into the open sea and is named Orca. Of the sides of Britain the shortest, which extends along Europe, is 7,500 stards, the second, from the strait to the E northern, tip, is 15,000 stards, and the last is 20,000 stards, so that the entire circuit of the island amounts to 42,500 stards. And Britain, we are told, is inhabited by tribes which are autochthonous and preserve in their ways of living the ancient manner of life. They use chariots, for instance, in their wars, even as tradition tells us the old Greek heroes did in the Trojan War, and their dwellings are humble, being built for the most part out of reeds or logs. The method they employ of harvesting their grain crops is to cut off no more than the heads and store them away in roofed granges, and then each day they pick out the ripened heads and grind them, getting in this way their food. Or as for their habits, they are simple and far removed from the shrewdness and vice which characterize the men of our day. Their way of living is modest, since they are well clear of the luxury which is begotten of wealth. The island is also thickly populated, and its climate is extremely cold, as one would expect, since it actually lies under the Great Bear. It is held by many kings and potentates, who for the most part live at peace among themselves. But we shall give a detailed account of the customs of Britain and of the other features which are peculiar to the island when we come to the campaign which Caesar undertook against it, and at this time we shall discuss the tin which the island produces. The inhabitants of Britain who dwell about the promontory known as Balirium are especially hospitable to strangers and have adopted a civilized manner of life because of their intercourse with merchants of other peoples. They it is who work the tin, treating the bed which bears it in an ingenious manner. This bed, being like rock, contains earthy seams and in them the workers quarry the ore, which they then melt down and cleanse of its impurities. Then they work the tin into pieces the size of knuckle bones and convey it to an island which lies off Britain and is called Ictus. For at the time of ebb tide the space between this island and the mainland becomes dry and they can take the tin in large quantities over to the island on their wagons. And a peculiar thing happens in the case of the neighbouring islands, which lie between Europe and Britain, for at flood tide the passages between them and the mainland run full and they have the appearance of islands but at ebb tide the sea recedes and leaves dry a large space, and at that time they look like peninsulas. On the island of Ictis the merchants purchase the tin of the natives and carry it from there across the strait to Galatea or Gaul, and finally, making their way on foot through Gaul for some thirty days, they bring their wares on horseback to the mouth of the river Rhone. But as regards the tin of Britain, we shall rest content with what has been said, and we shall now discuss the electron, as it is called, amber. Directly opposite the part of Scythia, which lies above Galatea, there is an island out in the open sea which is called Basiliae. On this island the waves of the sea cast up great quantities of what is known as amber, which is to be seen nowhere else in the inhabited world, and about it many of the ancient writers have composed fanciful tales, such as are altogether difficult to credit and have been refuted by later events. For many poets and historians give the story that Phaeton, the son of Helios, while yet a youth, persuaded his father to retire in his favour from his four-horse chariot for a single day, and when Helios yielded to the request Phaeton, as he drove the chariot, was unable to keep control of the reins, and the horses, making light of the youth, left their accustomed course. And first they turned aside to traverse the heavens, setting it afire and creating what is now called the Milky Way, and after that they brought the scorching rays to many parts of the inhabited earth and burned up not a little land. Consequently Zeus, being indignant because of what had happened, smote Phaeton with a thunderbolt and brought back the sun to its accustomed course. And Phaeton fell to the earth at the mouths of the river which is now known as the Padus, Po, but in ancient times was called the Eridanus, B, and his sisters vied with each other in bewailing his death and by reason of their exceeding grief underwent a metamorphosis of their nature, becoming poplar trees. And these poplars, at the same season each year, drip tears, and these, when they harden, form what men call amber, which in brilliance excels all else of the same nature and is commonly used in connection with the morning attending the death of the young. But since the creators of this fictitious tale have one and all erred, and have been refuted by what has transpired at later times, we must give ear to the accounts which are truthful, for the fact is that amber is gathered on the island we have mentioned and is brought by the natives to the opposite continent, and that it is conveyed through the continent to the regions known to us, as we have stated. Since we have set forth the facts concerning the islands, which lie in the western regions, 
we consider that it will not be foreign to our purpose to discuss briefly the tribes of Europe which lie near them and which we failed to mention in our former books. Now Celtica was ruled in ancient times, so we are told, by a renowned man who had a daughter who was of unusual stature and far excelled in beauty all the other maidens. But she, because of her strength of body and marvellous comeliness, was so haughty that she kept refusing every man who wooed her in marriage, since she believed that no one of her wooers was worthy of her. Now in the course of his campaign against the Gerions, Heracles visited Celtica and founded there the city of Elysia, and the maiden, on seeing Heracles, wondered at his prowess and his bodily superiority and accepted his embraces with all eagerness, her parents having given their consent. From this union she bore to Heracles a son named Galates, who far surpassed all the youths of the tribe in quality of spirit and strength of body. And when he had attained to man's estate and had succeeded to the throne of his fathers, he subdued a large part of the neighbouring territory and accomplished great feats in war. Becoming renowned for his bravery, he called his subjects Galatai or Gauls after himself, and these in turn gave their name to all of Galatia or Gaul. Since we have explained the name by which the Gauls are known, we must go on to speak about their land. Gaul is inhabited by many tribes of different size, for the largest number some 200,000 men, and the smallest 50,000, one of the latter standing on terms of kinship and friendship with the Romans, a relationship which has endured from ancient times down to our own day. And the land, lying as it does for the most part under the bears, has a wintry climate and is exceedingly cold. For during the winter season on cloudy days snow falls deep in place of rain, and on clear days ice and heavy frost are everywhere, and in such abundance that the rivers are frozen over, and are bridged by their own waters, for not only can chance travellers, proceeding a few at a time, make their way carry them on the ice, but even armies with their tens of thousands, together with their beasts of burden and heavily laden wagons, cross upon it in safety to the other side. And many large rivers flow through Gaul, and their streams cut this way and that through the level plain. Some of them flowing from bottomless lakes and others having their sources and affluence in the mountains, and some of them empty into the ocean and others into our sea. The largest one of those which flow into our waters is the Rhone, which has its sources in the Alps and empties into the sea by five mouths. But of the rivers which flow into the ocean the largest are thought to be the Danube and the Rhine, the latter of which the Caesar who has been called a god spanned with a bridge in our own day with astonishing skill, and leading his army across on foot he subdued the Gauls who lived beyond it. There are also many other navigable rivers in Celtica, but it would be a long task to write about them and almost all of them become frozen over by the cold and thus bridge their own streams, and since the natural smoothness of the ice makes the crossing slippery for those who pass over, they sprinkle chaff on it and thus have a crossing which is safe. A peculiar thing and unexpected takes place over the larger part of Gaul which we think we should not omit to mention. For from the direction of the sun's summer setting and from the north winds are wont to blow with such violence and force that they pick up from the ground rocks as large as can be held in the hand together with a dust composed of coarse gravel, and, generally speaking, when these winds rage violently they tear the weapons out of men's hands and the clothing off their backs and dismount riders from their horses. Furthermore, since temperateness of climate is destroyed by the excessive cold, the land produces neither wine nor oil, and as a consequence those Gauls who are deprived of these fruits make a drink out of barley which they call zythos or beer, and they also drink the water with which they cleanse their honeycombs. The Gauls are exceedingly addicted to the use of wine, and fill themselves with the wine which is brought into their country by merchants drinking it unmixed, and since they partake of this drink without moderation by reason of their craving for it, when they are drunken they fall into a stupor or a state of madness. Consequently many of the Italian traders, induced by the love of money which characterizes them, believe that the love of wine of these Gauls is their own godsend. For these transport the wine on the navigable rivers by means of boats and through the level plain on wagons, and receive for it an incredible price, for in exchange for a jar of wine they receive a slave, getting a servant in return for the drink. Throughout Gaul there is found practically no silver, but there is gold in great quantities, which nature provides for the inhabitants without their having to mine for it or to undergo any hardship. For the rivers, as they course through the country, having as they do sharp bends which turn this way and that and dashing against the mountains, which line their banks and bearing off great pieces of them, are full of gold dust. This is collected by those who occupy themselves in this business, and these men grind or crush the lumps which hold the dust, and after washing out with water the earthy elements in it they give the gold dust over to be melted in the furnaces. 
In this manner, they amass a great amount of gold, which is used for ornament not only by the women, but also by the men. For around their wrists and arms they wear bracelets, around their necks heavy necklaces of solid gold, and huge rings they wear as well, and even corslets of gold. And a peculiar and striking practice is found among the upper Celts. In connection with the sacred precincts of the gods, as for in the temples and precincts made consecrate in their land, a great amount of gold has been deposited as a dedication to the gods, and not a native of the country ever touches it because of religious scruple, although the Celts are an exceedingly covetous people. The Gauls are tall of body, with rippling muscles, and white of skin, and their hair is blonde, and not only naturally so, but they also make it their practice by artificial means to increase the distinguishing colour which nature has given it for they are always washing their hair in lime water, and they pull it back from the forehead to the top of the head and back to the nape of the neck, with the result that their appearance is like that of satyrs and pans, since the treatment of their hair makes it so heavy and coarse that it differs in no respect from the manet of horses. Some of them shave the beard, but others let it grow a little, and the nobles shave their cheeks, but they let the moustache grow until it covers the mouth. Consequently, when they are eating, their moustaches become entangled in the food, and when they are drinking, the beverage passes, as it were, through a kind of a strainer. When they dine they all sit, not upon chairs, but upon the ground, using for cushions the skins of wolves or of dogs. The service at the meals is performed by the youngest children, both male and female, who are of suitable age, and near at hand are their fireplaces heaped with coals, and on them are cauldrons and spits holding whole pieces of meat. Brave warriors, they reward with the choicest portions of the meat, in the same manner as the poet introduces Arjux as honoured by the chiefs after he returned victorious from his single combat with Hector, to Arjux then were given of the chine slices, full length, unto his honour. They invite strangers to their feasts, and do not inquire until after the meal who they are and of what things they stand in need. And it is their custom, even during the course of the meal, to seize upon any trivial matter as an occasion for keen disputation and then to challenge one another to single combat, without any regard for their lives, for the belief of Pythagoras prevails among them, that the souls of men are immortal and that after a prescribed number of years they commence upon a new life, the soul entering into another body. Consequently, we are told, at the funerals of their dead some cast letters upon the pyre which they have written to their deceased kinsmen, as if the dead would be able to read these letters. In their journeyings, and when they go into battle the Gauls use chariots drawn by two horses, which carry the charioteer and the warrior, and when they encounter cavalry in the fighting they first hurl their javelins at the enemy and then step down from their chariots and join battle with their swords. Certain of them despise death to such a degree that they enter the perils of battle without protective armour and with no more than a girdle about their loins. They bring along to war also their free men to serve them, choosing them out from among the poor, and these attendants they use in battle as charioteers and as shield-bearers. It is also their custom, when they are formed for battle, to step out in front of the line and to challenge the most valiant men from among their opponents to single combat, brandishing their weapons in front of them to terrify their adversaries. And when any man accepts the challenge to battle, they then break forth into a song in praise of the valiant deeds of their ancestors and in boast of their own high achievements reviling all the while and belittling their opponent, and trying, in a word, by such talk to strip him of his bold spirit before the combat. When their enemies fall they cut off their heads and fasten them about the necks of their horses, and turning over to their attendants the arms of their opponents, all covered with blood, they carry them off as booty, singing a paean over them and striking up a song of victory, and these first fruits of battle they fasten by nails upon their houses, just as men do, in certain kinds of hunting with the heads of wild beasts they have mastered. The heads of their most distinguished enemies they embalm in seed oil and carefully preserve in a chest, and these they exhibit to strangers, gravely maintaining that in exchange for this head some one of their ancestors, or their father, or the man himself, refused the offer of a great sum of money. And some men among them, we are told, boast that they have not accepted an equal weight of gold for the head they show displaying a barbarous sort of greatness of soul, for not to sell that which constitutes a witness and proof of one's valour is a noble thing, but to continue to fight against one of our own race, after he is dead, is to descend to the level of beasts. The clothing they wear is striking, shirts which have been dyed and embroidered in varied colours, and breeches, which they call in their tongue brachi, and they wear striped coats, fastened by a buckle on the shoulder, heavy for winter wear and light for summer, in which are set checks, close together and of varied hues. 
for armor they use long shields. As high as a man, which are wrought in a manner peculiar to them, some of them even having the figures of animals embossed on them in bronze, and these are skillfully worked with an eye not only to beauty but also to protection. On their heads they put bronze helmets, which have large embossed figures standing out from them and give an appearance of great size to those who wear them, for in some cases horns are attached to the helmet so as to form a single piece, in other cases images of the four parts of birds or four-footed animals. Their trumpets are of peculiar nature and such as barbarians use, for when they are blown upon they give forth a harsh sound, appropriate to the tumult of war. Some of them have iron cuirasses, chain wrought, but others are satisfied with the armour which nature has given them and go into battle naked. In place of the short sword they carry long broadswords which are hung on chains of iron or bronze and are worn along the right flank. And some of them gather up their shirts with belts plated with gold or silver. The spears they brandish, which they call lancey, have iron heads a cubit in length and even more, and a little under two palms in breadth, for their swords are not shorter than the javelins of other peoples, and the heads of their javelins are larger than the swords of others. Some of these javelins come from the forge straight, others twist in and out in spiral shapes for their entire length, the purpose being that the thrust may not only cut the flesh, but mangle it as well, and that the withdrawal of the spear may lacerate the wound. The Gauls are terrifying in aspect and their voices are deep and altogether harsh, when they meet together they converse with few words and in riddles, hinting darkly at things for the most part and using one word when they mean another, and they like to talk in superlatives, to the end that they may extol themselves and depreciate all other men. They are also boasters and threateners and are fond of pompous language, and yet they have sharp wits and are not without cleverness at learning. Among them are also to be found lyric poets whom they call bards. These men sing to the accompaniment of instruments which are like lyres, and their songs may be either of praise or of obloquy. Philosophers, as we may call them, and men learned in religious affairs are unusually honoured among them and are called by them druids. The Gauls likewise make use of diviners, accounting them worthy of high approbation. And these men foretell the future by means of the flight or cries of birds and of the slaughter of sacred animals. And they have all the multitude subservient to them. They also observe a custom which is especially astonishing and incredible, in case they are taking thought with respect to matters of great concern, for in such cases they devote to death a human being and plunge a dagger into him in the region above the diaphragm, and when the stricken victim has fallen they read the future from the manner of his fall and from the twitching of his limbs, as well as from the gushing of the blood, having learned to place confidence in an ancient and long. Continued practice of observing such matters and it is a custom of theirs that no one should perform a sacrifice without a philosopher, for thank offerings should be rendered to the gods, they say, by the hands of men who are experienced in the nature of the divine, and who speak, as it were, the language of the gods, and it is also through the mediation of such men, they think, that blessings likewise should be sought. Nor is it only in the exigencies of peace, but in their wars as well, that they obey, before all others, these men and their chanting poets, and such obedience is observed not only by their friends but also by their enemies, many times, for instance, when two armies approach each other in battle with swords drawn and spears thrust forward, these men step forth between them and cause them to cease, as though having cast a spell over certain kinds of wild beasts. In this way, even among the wildest barbarians, does passion give place before wisdom, and ours stands in awe of the muses. And now it will be useful to draw a distinction which is unknown to many, the peoples who dwell in the interior above Massalia, those on the slopes of the Alps, and those on this side the Pyrenees mountains are called Celts, whereas the peoples who are established above this land of Celtica in the parts which stretch to the north, both along the ocean and along the Hercynian mountain, and all the peoples who come after these, as far as Scythia, are known as Gauls. The Romans, however, include all these nations together under a single name, calling them one and all Gauls. The women of the Gauls are not only like the men in their great stature but they are a match for them in courage as well. Their children are usually born with greyish hair, but as they grow older the colour of their hair changes to that of their parents. The most savage peoples among them are those who dwell beneath the bears and on the borders of Scythia, and some of these, we are told, eat human beings, even as the Britons do who dwell on Iris, as it is called. And since the valour of these peoples and their savage ways have been famed abroad, some men say that it was they who in ancient times overran all Asia and were called Sumerians, time having slightly corrupted the word into the name of Cimbrians, as they are now called.
for it has been their ambition from old to plunder, invading for this purpose the lands of others, and to regard all men with contempt. For they are the people who captured Rome, who plundered the sanctuary at Delphi, who levied tribute upon a large part of Europe and no small part of Asia, and settled themselves upon the lands of the peoples they had subdued in war, being called in time Greco-Gauls, because they became mixed with the Greeks, and who, as their last accomplishment, have destroyed many large Roman armies. And in pursuance of their savage ways, they manifest an outlandish impiety also with respect to their sacrifices, for their criminals they keep prisoner for five years, and then impale in honour of the gods, dedicating them together with many other offerings of first fruits and constructing pyres of great size. Captives also are used by them as victims for their sacrifices in honour of the gods. Certain of them likewise slay, together with the human beings, such animals as are taken in war, or burn them or do away with them in some other vengeful fashion. Although their wives are comely, they have very little to do with them, but rage with lust, in outlandish fashion, for the embraces of males. It is their practice to sleep upon the ground on the skins of wild beasts and to tumble with a catamite on each side. And the most astonishing thing of all is that they feel no concern for their proper dignity, but prostitute to others without a qualm the flower of their bodies, nor do they consider this a disgraceful thing to do, but rather when any one of them is thus approached and refuses the favour offered him, this they consider an act of dishonour. Now that we have spoken at sufficient length about the Celts, we shall turn our history to the Celtiberians who are their neighbours. In ancient times these two peoples, namely, the Iberians and the Celts, kept warring among themselves over the land, but when later they arranged their differences and settled upon the land altogether, and when they went further and agreed to intermarriage with each other, because of such intermixture the two peoples received the appellation given above. And since it was two powerful nations that united and the land of theirs was fertile, it came to pass that the Celtiberians advanced far in fame and were subdued by the Romans with difficulty and only after they had faced them in battle over a long period. And this people, it would appear, provide for warfare not only excellent cavalry but also foot soldiers who excel in prowess and endurance. They wear rough black cloaks, the wool of which resembles the hair of goats. As for their arms, certain of the Celtiberians carry light shields like those of the Gauls, and certain carry circular wicker shields as large as an aspis, and about their shins and calves they wind greaves made of hair and on their heads they wear bronze helmets adorned with purple crests. The swords they wear are two-edged and wrought of excellent iron, and they also have dirks a span in length which they use in fighting at close quarters. And a peculiar practice is followed by them in the fashioning of their defensive weapons, for they bury plates of iron in the ground and leave them there until in the course of time the rust has eaten out what is weak in the iron, and what is left is only the most unyielding. And of this they then fashion excellent swords and such other objects as pertain to war. The weapon which has been fashioned in the manner described cuts through anything which gets in its way, for no shield or helmet or bone can withstand a blow from it, because of the exceptional quality of the iron. Able as they are to fight in two styles, they first carry on the contest on horseback, and when they have defeated the cavalry they dismount, and assuming the role of foot soldiers, they put up marvellous battles. And a peculiar and strange custom obtains among them, careful and cleanly as they are in their ways of living, they nevertheless observe one practice, which is low and partakes of great uncleanness, for they consistently use urine to bathe the body and wash their teeth with it, thinking that in this practice is constituted the care and healing of the body. As for the customs they follow toward malefactors and enemies the Celtiberians are cruel, but toward strangers they are honourable and humane. Strangers, for instance, who come among them they one and all entreat to stop at their homes, and they are rivals one of another in their hospitality, and any among them who are attended by strangers are spoken of with approval and regarded as beloved of the gods. For their food they use meats of every description, of which they enjoy an abundance, since the country supplies them with a great quantity of honey, although the wine they purchase from merchants who sail over the seas to them. Of the tribes neighbouring upon the Celtiberians the most advanced is the people of the Vakii, as they are called, for this people each year divides among its members the land which it tills, and making the fruits the property of all they measure out his portion to each man. And for any cultivators who have appropriated some part for themselves, they have set the penalty as death. The most valiant among the Iberians are those who are known as Lusitanians, who carry in war very small shields which are interwoven with cords of sinew and are able to protect the body unusually well, because they are so tough, and shifting this shield easily as they do in their fighting, 
now here, now there, they cleverly ward off from their person every blow which comes at them. They also use barbed javelins made entirely of iron and wear helmets and swords very much like those of the Celtiberians. They hurl the javelin with good effect, even over a long distance, and, in fine, are doughty in dealing their blows. Since they are nimble and wear light arms, they are swift both in flight and in pursuit, but when it comes to enduring the hardships of a stiff fight they are far inferior to the Celtiberians. In time of peace they practice a kind of elfin dance which requires great nimbleness of limb. And in their wars they march into battle with even step and raise a battle song as they charge upon the foe. And a peculiar practice obtains among the Iberians, and particularly among the Lusitanians, for when their young men come to the bloom of their physical strength, those who are the very poorest among them in worldly goods and yet excel in vigour of body and daring equip themselves with no more than valour and arms and gather in the mountain fastnesses, where they form into bands of considerable size and then descend upon Iberia and collect wealth from their pillaging. And this brigandage they continually practice in a spirit of complete disdain, for using as they do light arms and being altogether nimble and swift, they are a most difficult people for other men to subdue. And, speaking generally, they consider the fastnesses and crags of the mountains to be their native land and to these places, which large and heavily equipped armies find hard to traverse, they flee for refuge. Consequently, although the Romans in their frequent campaigns against the Lusitanians rid them of their great spirit of disdain, they were nevertheless unable, often as they eagerly set about it, to put a complete end to their plundering. Since we have set forth the facts concerning the Iberians, we think that it will not be foreign to our purpose to discuss the silver mines of the land, for this land possesses, we may venture to say, the most abundant and most excellent known sources of silver, and to the workers of this silver it returns great revenues. Now in the preceding books which told of the achievements of Heracles, we have mentioned the mountains in Iberia, which are known as the Pyrenees. Both in height and in size these mountains are found to excel all others, for they stretch from the southern sea practically as far as the northern ocean and extend for some 3,000 stards, dividing Gaul from Iberia and Celtiberia. And since they contain many thick and deep forests, in ancient times, we are told, certain herdsmen left a fire and the whole area of the mountains was entirely consumed, and due to this fire, since it raged continuously day after day. The surface of the earth was also burned and the mountains because of what had taken place, were called the Pyrenees, furthermore, the surface of the burned land ran with much silver and, since the elementary substance out of which the silver is worked was melted down, there were formed many streams of pure silver. Now the natives were ignorant of the use of the silver, and the Phoenicians, as they pursued their commercial enterprises and learned of what had taken place, purchased the silver in exchange for other wares of little if any worth. And this was the reason why the Phoenicians, as they transported this silver to Greece and Asia, and to all other peoples, acquired great wealth. So far indeed did the merchants go in their greed that, in case their boats were fully laden and there still remained a great amount of silver, they would hammer the lead off the anchors and have the silver perform the service of the lead. And the result was that the Phoenicians, as in the course of many years, they prospered greatly. Thanks to commerce of this kind sent forth many colonies, some to Sicily and its neighbouring islands, and others to Libya, Sardinia, and Iberia. But at a much later time the Iberians, having come to know the peculiar qualities possessed by silver, sunk notable mines, and as a consequence, by working the most excellent and, we may say, the most abundant silver to be found, they received great revenues. The manner, then, in which the Iberians mine and work the silver is in part as follows. The mines being marvellous in their deposits of copper and gold and silver, the workers of the copper mines recover from the earth they dig out a fourth part of pure copper, and among the unskilled workers in silver there are some who will take out a euboic talent in three days, for all the ore is full of solid silver dust which gleams forth from it. Consequently a man may well be filled with wonder both at the nature of the region and at the diligence displayed by the men who labour there. Now at first unskilled labourers, whoever might come, carried on the working of the mines, and these men took great wealth away with them, since the silver-bearing earth was convenient at hand and abundant, but at a later time, after the Romans had made themselves masters of Iberia. A multitude of Italians have sworn to the mines and taken great wealth away with them. Such was their greed. For they purchase a multitude of slaves whom they turn over to the overseers of the working of the mines, and these men, opening shafts in a number of places and digging deep into the ground, seek out the seams of earth which are rich in silver and gold, and not only do they go into the ground a great distance, 
but they also push their digging's many studs in depth and run galleries off at every angle, turning this way and that, in this manner bringing up from the depths the ore which gives them the profit they are seeking. Great also is the contrast these mines show when they are compared with those of Attica. The men, that is, who work the Attic mines, although they have expended large sums on the undertakings, yet now and then, what they hoped to get, they did not get, and what they had, they lost, so that it would appear that they met with misfortune in a kind of riddle, but the exploiters of the mines of Spain, in their hopes, amass great wealth from their undertakings. For their first labours are remunerative, thanks to the excellent quality of the earth for this sort of thing, and they are ever coming upon more splendid veins, rich in both silver and gold, for all the ground in that region is a tangled network of veins which wind in many ways. And now and then, as they go down deep, they come upon flowing subterranean rivers, but they overcome the might of these rivers by diverting the streams which flow in on them by means of channels leading off at an angle. For being urged on as they are by expectations of gain, which indeed do not deceive them, they push each separate undertaking to its conclusion, and what is the most surprising thing of all, they draw out the waters of the streams they encounter by means of what is called by men the Egyptian screw, which was invented by Archimedes of Syracuse at the time of his visit to Egypt, and by the use of such screws they carry the water in successive lifts as far as the entrance, drying up in. This way the spot where they are digging and making it well suited to the furtherance of their operations. Since this machine is an exceptionally ingenious device, an enormous amount of water is thrown out, to one's astonishment, by means of a trifling amount of labour. And all the water from such rivers is brought up easily from the depths and poured out on the surface. And a man may well marvel at the inventiveness of the craftsman, in connection not only with this invention, but with many other greater ones as well, the fame of which has encompassed the entire inhabited world and of which we shall give a detailed and precise account when we come to the period of Archimedes. But to continue with the mines, the slaves who are engaged in the working of them produce for their masters revenues in sums defying belief, but they themselves wear out their bodies both by day and by night in the diggings under the earth, dying in large numbers because of the exceptional hardships they endure. For no respite or pause is granted them in their labours, but compelled beneath blows of the overseers to endure the severity of their plight, they throw away their lives in this wretched manner, although certain of them who can endure it, by virtue of their bodily strength and their persevering souls, suffer such hardships over a long period, indeed death in their eyes is more to be desired than life, because of the magnitude of the hardships they must bear. And although many are the astounding features connected with the mining just described, a man may wonder not the least at the fact that not one of the mines has a recent beginning. But all of them were opened by the covetousness of the Carthaginians at the time when Iberia was among their possessions. It was from these mines, that is, that they drew their continued growth, hiring the ablest mercenaries to be found and winning with their aid many and great wars. For it is in general true that in their wars the Carthaginians never wrested their confidence in soldiers from among their own citizens or gathered from their allies, but that when they subjected the Romans and the Sicilians and the inhabitants of Libya to the greatest perils it was by money, thanks to the abundance of it which they derived from their mines, that they conquered them in every instance. For the Phoenicians, it appears, were from ancient times clever men in making discoveries to their gain, and the Italians are equally clever in leaving no gain to anyone else. Tin also occurs in many regions of Iberia, not found, however, on the surface of the earth. As certain writers continually repeat in their histories, but dug out of the ground and smelted in the same manner as silver and gold. For there are many mines of tin in the country above Lusitania and on the islets which lie off Iberia out in the ocean and are called because of that fact the Cassiterides. And tin is brought in large quantities also from the island of Britain to the opposite Gaul, where it is taken by merchants on horses through the interior of Celtica both to the Massalians and to the city of Narbo, as it is called. This city is a colony of the Romans, and because of its convenient situation it possesses the finest market to be found in those regions. Since we have discussed the Gauls, the Celtiberians, and the Iberians, we shall pass on to the Ligurians. The Ligurians inhabit a land which is stony and altogether wretched, and the life they live is, by reason of the toils and the continuous hardships they endure in their labour, a grievous one and unfortunate. For the land being thickly wooded, some of them fell the wood the whole day long, equipped with efficient and heavy axes, and others, whose task it is to prepare the ground, do in fact for the larger part quarry out rocks by reason of the exceeding stoniness of the land, for their tools never dig up a clod without a stone. 
Since their labor entails such hardship as this, it is only by perseverance that they surmount nature and that after many distresses they gather scanty harvests and no more. By reason of their continued physical activity and minimum of nourishment the Ligurians are slender and vigorous of body. To aid them in their hardships they have their women, who have become accustomed to labor on an equal basis with the men. They are continually hunting, whereby they get abundant game and compensate in this way for the lack of the fruits of the field. Consequently, spending their lives as they do on snow-covered mountains, where they are used to traversing unbelievably rugged places, they become vigorous and muscular of body. Some of the Ligurians, because of the lack among them of the fruits of the earth, drink nothing but water, and they eat the flesh of both domestic and wild animals, and fill themselves with the green things which grow in the land, the land they possess being untrodden by the most kindly of the gods, namely, Demeter and Dionys. The nights the Ligurians spend in the fields, rarely in a kind of crude shanty or hut, more often in the hollows of rocks and natural caves which may offer them sufficient protection. In pursuance of these habits, they have also other practices wherein they preserve the manner of life which is primitive and lacking in implements. Speaking generally, in these regions the women possess the vigour and might of men, and the men those of wild beasts. Indeed, they say that oftentimes in campaigns the mightiest warrior among the Gauls has been challenged to single combat by a quite slender Ligurian and slain. The weapons of the Ligurians are lighter in their structure than those of the Romans, for their protection is a long shield, worked in the Gallic fashion, and a shirt gathered in with a belt, and about them they throw the skins of wild animals and carry a sword of moderate size, but some of them, now that they have been incorporated in the Roman state, have changed the type of their weapons, adapting themselves to their rulers. And they are venturesome and of noble spirit, not only in war, but in those circumstances of life which offer terrifying hardships or perils. As traders, for instance, they sail over the Sardinian and Libyan seas, readily casting themselves into dangers from which there is no succour, for although the vessels they use are more cheaply fashioned than makeshift boats and their equipment is the minimum of that usual on ships, yet to one's astonishment and terror they will face the most fearful conditions which storms create. It remains for us now to speak of the Tyrrhenians. This people, excelling as they did in manly vigour, in ancient times possessed great territory and founded many notable cities. Likewise, because they also availed themselves of powerful naval forces and were masters of the sea over a long period, they caused the sea along Italy to be named Tyrrhenian after them, and because they also perfected the organisation of land forces, they were the inventors of the Salpinx, as it is called, a discovery of the greatest usefulness for war and named after them the Tyrrhenian trumpet. They were also the authors of that dignity which surrounds rulers, providing their rulers with lictors and an ivory stool and a toga with a purple band, and in connection with their houses they invented the peristyle, a useful device for avoiding the confusion connected with the attending throngs, and these things were adopted for the most part by the Romans, who added to their embellishment and transferred them to their own political institutions letters, and the teaching about nature and the gods they also brought to greater perfection, and they elaborated the art of divination by thunder and lightning more than all other men, and it is for this reason that the people who rule practically the entire inhabited world show honour to these men even to this day, and employ them as interpreters of the omens of Zeus as they appear in thunder and lightning. The land the Tyrrhenians inhabit bears every crop, and from the intensive cultivation of it they enjoy no lack of fruits, not only sufficient for their sustenance, but contributing to abundant enjoyment and luxury. For example, twice each day they spread costly tables and upon them everything that is appropriate to excessive luxury, providing gay-coloured couches and having ready at hand a multitude of silver drinking cups of every description and servants in waiting in no small number, and these attendants are some of them of exceeding comeliness and others are arrayed in clothing more costly than befits the station of a slave. Their dwellings are of every description and of individuality, those not only of their magistrates, but of the majority of the free men as well. And, speaking generally, they have now renounced the spirit which was emulated by their forebears from ancient times. And passing their lives as they do in drinking bouts and unmanly amusements, it is easily understood how they have lost the glory in warfare which their fathers possessed. Not the least of the things which have contributed to their luxury is the fertility of the land, for since it bears every product of the soil and is altogether fertile, the Tyrrhenians lay up great stores of every kind of fruit. In general, indeed, Tyrrhenia, being altogether fertile, lies in extended open fields and is traversed at intervals by areas, which rise up like hills and yet are fit for tillage, and it enjoys moderate rainfall not only in the winter season but in the summer as well. 
but now that we have described the lands which lie to the west and those which extend toward the north, and also the islands in the ocean, we shall in turn discuss the islands in the ocean to the south which lie off that portion of Arabia which extends to the east and borders upon the country known as Cedrosia. Arabia contains many villages and notable cities, which in some cases are situated upon great mounds and in other instances are built upon hillocks or in plains, and the largest cities have royal residences of costly construction, possessing a multitude of inhabitants and ample estates. And the entire land of the Arabians abounds with domestic animals of every description, and it bears fruits as well and provides no lack of pasturage for the fatted animals, and many rivers flow through the land and irrigate a great portion of it, thus contributing to the full maturing of the fruits. Consequently, that part of Arabia, which holds the chief place for its fertility has received a name appropriate to it. Being called Arabia the Blessed. On the farthest bounds of Arabia the Blessed, where the ocean washes it, there lie opposite it a number of islands, of which there are three which merit a mention in history, one of them bearing the name Hiera or Sacred, on which it is not allowed to bury the dead, and another lying near it, seven stards distant, to which they take the bodies of the dead whom they see fit to inter. Now Hiera has no share in any other fruit, but it produces frankincense in such abundance as to suffice for the honours paid to the gods throughout the entire inhabited world, and it possesses also an exceptional quantity of myrrh and every variety of all the other kinds of incense of highly fragrant odour. The nature of frankincense and the preparing of it is like this, in size it is a small tree, and in appearance it resembles the white Egyptian acacia, its leaves are like those of the willow, as it is called, the bloom it bears is in colour like gold. And the frankincense which comes from it oozes forth in drops like tears. But the myrrh tree is like the mastic tree, although its leaves are more slender and grow thicker. It oozes myrrh when the earth is dug away from the roots, and if it is planted in fertile soil this takes place twice a year, in spring and in summer, the myrrh of the spring is red, because of the dew, but that of the summer is white. They also gather the fruit of the Christ's thorn, which they use both for meat and for drink and as a drug for the cure of dysentery. The land of Hiera is divided among its inhabitants, and the king takes for himself the best land and likewise a tithe of the fruits which the island produces. The width of the island is reputed to be about 200 stards. And the inhabitants of the island are known as Pancheans, and these men take the frankincense and myrrh across to the mainland and sell it to Arab merchants, from whom others in turn purchase wares of this kind and convey them to Phoenician and Celesyria and Egypt, and in the end merchants convey them from these countries throughout all the inhabited world. And there is yet another large island, thirty stards distant from the one we have mentioned, lying out in the ocean to the east and many stards in length, for men say that from its promontory which extends toward the east one can descry India, misty because of its great distance. As for Panchir itself, the island possesses many things which are deserving to be recorded by history. It is inhabited by men who were sprung from the soil itself, called Pancheans, and the foreigners there are Oceanites and Indians and Scythians and Cretans. There is also a notable city on the island, called Panara, which enjoys unusual felicity, its citizens are called suppliants of Zeus Trifilius, and they are the only inhabitants of the land of Panchia who live under laws of their own making and have no king over them. Each year they elect three chief magistrates, these men have no authority over capital crimes, but render judgment in all any other matters, and the weightiest affairs they refer of their own accord to the priests. Some sixty stards distant from the city of Panara is the temple of Zeus Trifilius, which lies out on a level plain and is especially admired for its antiquity, the costliness of its construction, and its favourable situation. Thus, the plain lying around the temple is thickly covered with trees of every kind, not only such as bear fruit, but those also which possess the power of pleasing the eye after the plain abounds with cypresses of enormous size and plane trees and sweet bay and myrtle, since the region is full of springs of water. Indeed, close to the sacred precinct there bursts forth from the earth a spring of sweet water of such size that it gives rise to a river on which boats may sail. And since the water is led off from the river to many parts of the plain and irrigates them, throughout the entire area of the plain there grow continuous forests of lofty trees. Wherein a multitude of men pass their time in the summer season and a multitude of birds make their nests. Birds of every kind and of various hues, which greatly delight the ear by their song, therein also is every kind of garden and many meadows with varied plants and flowers, so that there is a divine majesty in the prospect which makes the place appear worthy of the gods of the country. And there were palm trees there with mighty trunks, conspicuous for the fruits they bore, and many varieties of nut-bearing trees, 
which provide the natives of the place with the most abundant subsistence. And in addition to what we have mentioned, grape vines were found there in great number and of every variety, which were trained to climb high and were variously intertwined so that they presented a pleasing sight and provided an enjoyment of the season without further ado. The temple was a striking structure of white marble, two plethora in length and the width proportionate to the length, it was supported by large thick columns and decorated at intervals with reliefs of ingenious design, and there were also remarkable statues of the gods, exceptional in skill of execution and admired by men for their massiveness. Around about the temple the priests who served the gods had their dwellings, and the management of everything pertaining to the sacred precinct was in their hands. Leading from the temple an avenue had been constructed, for stards in length and a plethora in width. On each side of the avenue are great bronze vessels which rest upon square bases, and at the end of the avenue the river we mentioned above has its sources, which pour forth in a turbulent stream. The water of the stream is exceedingly clear and sweet and the use of it is most conducive to the health of the body, and the river bears the name or water of the sun. The entire spring is surrounded by an expensive stone key, which extends along each side of it for stards, and no man except the priests may set foot upon the place up to the edge of the quay. The plain lying below the temple has been made sacred to the gods, for a distance of two hundred stards, and the revenues which are derived from it are used to support the sacrifices. Beyond the above-mentioned plain there is a lofty mountain which has been made sacred to the gods and is called the throne of Uranus, and also Triphilian Olympus. For the myth relates that in ancient times, when Uranus was king of the inhabited earth, he took pleasure in tarrying in that place and in surveying from its lofty top both the heavens and the stars therein, and that at a later time it came to be called Triphilian Olympus because the men who dwelt about it were composed of three peoples, these, namely, were known as Pancheans, Oceanites, and Doyans, who were expelled at a later time by Ammon. For Ammon, men say, not only drove this nation into exile but also totally destroyed their cities, raising to the ground both Doya and Asterusia. And once a year, we are told, the priests hold a sacrifice in this mountain with great solemnity. Beyond this mountain, and throughout the rest of the land of Panchiaitis, the account continues, there is found a multitude of beasts of every description, for the land possesses many elephants and lions and leopards and gazelles and an unusual number of other wild animals which differ in their aspect and are of marvellous ferocity. This island also contains three notable cities, Hyratia, Dallas, and Oceanes. The whole country, moreover, is fruitful and possesses in particular a multitude of vines of every variety. The men are warlike and use chariots in battle after the ancient manner. The entire body politic of the Pancheans is divided into three castes, the first caste among them is that of the priests, to whom are assigned the artisans, the second consists of the farmers, and the third is that of the soldiers, to whom are added the herdsmen. The priests served as the leaders in all things, rendering the decisions in legal disputes and possessing the final authority in all other affairs which concerned the community, and the farmers, who are engaged in the tilling of the soil, bring the fruits into the common store, and the man among them who is thought to have practiced the best farming receives a special reward when the fruits are portioned out, the priests deciding who had been first, who second, and so in order to the tenth, this being done in order to spur on the rest. In the same manner the herdsmen also turned both the sacrificial animals and all others into the treasury of the state with all precision, some by number and some by weight. 4. Speaking generally, there is not a thing except a home and a garden which a man may possess for his own, but all the products and the revenues are taken over by the priests, who portion out with justice to each man his share, and to the priests alone is given twofold. The clothing of the Pancheans is soft, because the wool of the sheep of the land is distinguished above all other for its softness, and they wear ornaments of gold, not only the women but the men as well, with collars of twisted gold about their necks, bracelets on their wrists, and rings hanging from their ears after the manner of the Persians. The same kind of shoes are worn by both sexes, and they are worked in more varied colours than is usual. The soldiers receive a pay which is apportioned to them and in return protect the land by means of forts and posts fixed at intervals, for there is one section of the country which is infested with robber bands, composed of bold and lawless men who lie in wait for the farmer and war upon them. And as for the priests, they far excel the rest in luxury and in every other refinement and elegance of their manner of life. So, for instance, their robes are of linen and exceptionally sheer and soft, and at times they wear garments woven of the softest wool, furthermore, their headdress is interwoven with gold, 
their footgear consists of sandals which are of varied colors and ingeniously worked, and they wear the same gold ornaments as do the women, with the exception of the earrings. The first duties of the priests concerned with the services paid to the gods, and with the hymns and praises which are accorded them. And in them they recite in song the achievements of the gods one after another, and the benefactions they have bestowed upon mankind. According to the myth which the priests give, the gods had their origin in Crete, and were led by Zeus to Panchia at the time when he sojourned among men and was king of the inhabited earth. In proof of this they cite their language, pointing out that most of the things they have about them still retain their Cretan names, and they add that the kinship which they have with the Cretans and the kindly regard they feel toward them are traditions they received from their ancestors, since this report is ever handed down from one generation to another. And it has been their practice, in corroboration of these claims, to point to inscriptions which, they said, were made by Zeus during the time he still sojourned among men and founded the temple. The land possesses rich mines of gold, silver, copper, tin, and iron, but none of these metals is allowed to be taken from the island, nor may the priests for any reason whatsoever set foot outside of the hallowed land, and if one of them does so, whoever meets him is authorized to slay him. There are many great dedications of gold and of silver which have been made to the gods, since time has amassed the multitude of such offerings. The doorways of the temple are objects of wonder in their construction, being worked in silver and gold and ivory and citrus wood. And there is the couch of the god, which is six cubits long and four wide and is entirely of gold and skillfully constructed in every detail of its workmanship. Similar to it both in size and in costliness in general is the table of the god which stands near the couch. And on the centre of the couch stands a large gold stele which carries letters which the Egyptians call sacred, and the inscription recounts the deeds both of Uranus and of Zeus. And to them there were added by Hermes the deeds also of Artemis and of Apollo. As regards the islands, then, which lie in the ocean opposite Arabia, we shall rest content with what has been said. We shall now give an account of the islands, which lie in the neighbourhood of Greece and in the Aegean Sea, beginning with Samothrace. This island, according to some, was called Samos in ancient times, but when the island now known as Samos came to be settled, because the names were the same, the ancient Samos came to be called Samothrace from the land of Thrace which lies opposite it. It was settled by men who were sprung from the soil itself, consequently no tradition has been handed down regarding who were the first men and leaders on the island. But some say that in ancient days it was called Saonesis and that it received the name of Samothrace because of the settlers who emigrated to it from both Samos and Thrace. The first and original inhabitants used an ancient language which was peculiar to them and of which many words are preserved to this day in the ritual of their sacrifices. And the Samothracians have a story that, before the floods which befell their peoples, a great one took place among them, in the course of which the outlet at the Cyanian rocks was first rent asunder and then the Hellespont. For the Pontus, which had at the time the form of a lake, was so swollen by the rivers which flow into it, that, because of the great flood which had poured into it, its waters burst forth violently into the Hellespont and flooded a large part of the coast of Asia and made no small amount of the level part of the land of Samothrace into a sea, and this is the reason, we are told, why in later times fishermen have now and then brought up in their nets the stone capitals of columns, since even cities were covered by the inundation. The inhabitants who had been caught by the flood, the account continues, ran up to the higher regions of the island, and when the sea kept rising higher and higher, they prayed to the native gods, and since their lives were spared. To commemorate their rescue they set up boundary stones about the entire circuit of the island and dedicated altars upon which they offer sacrifices even to the present day. For these reasons it is patent that they inhabited Samothrace before the flood. After the events we have described one of the inhabitants of the island, a certain Saon, who was a son, as some say, of Zeus and Nymph, but, according to others, of Hermes and Rhene, gathered into one body the peoples who were dwelling in scattered habitations and established laws for them, and he was given the name Saon after the island, but the multitude of the people he distributed among five tribes which he named after his sons. And while the Samothracians were living under a government of this kind, they say that there were born in that land to Zeus and Electra, who was one of the Atlantids, Dardanus and Iasian and Harmonia. Of these children Dardanus, who was a man who entertained great designs and was the first to make his way across to Asia in a makeshift boat, founded at the outset a city called Dardanus, organized the kingdom which lay about the city which was called Troy at a later time, and called the people's Dardanians after himself. 
They say also that he ruled over many nations throughout Asia and that the Dardani who dwell beyond Thrace were colonists sent forth by him. But Zeus desired that the other of his two sons might also attain to honour, and so he instructed him in the initiatory rite of the mysteries, which had existed on the island since ancient times, but was at that time, so to speak, put in his hands, it is not lawful, however, for any but the initiated to hear about the mysteries. An Iasian is reputed to have been the first to initiate strangers into them and by this means to bring the initiatory rite to high esteem. And after this Cadmus, the son of Age Nor, came in the course of his quest for Europe to the Samothracians, and after participating in the initiation he married Harmonia, who was the sister of Iasian and not, as the Greeks recount in their mythologies, the daughter of Ars. This wedding of Cadmus and Harmonia was the first, we are told, for which the gods provided the marriage feast, and Demeter, becoming enamoured of Iasian, presented him with the fruit of the corn, Hermes gave a lyre, Athena the renowned necklace and a robe and a flute, and Electra the sacred rites of the great mother of the gods, as she is called, together with cymbals and kettle drums and the instruments of her ritual, and Apollo played upon the lyre and the muses upon their flutes and the rest of the gods spoke them fair and gave the pair their aid in the celebration of the wedding. After this Cadmus, they say, in accordance with the oracle he had received, founded Thebes in Boeotia, while Aesian married Sibylle and begat Corybas. And after Aesian had been removed into the circle of the gods, Dardanus and Sibylle and Corybas conveyed to Asia the sacred rites of the mother of the gods and removed with them to Phrygia. Thereupon Sibylle, joining herself to the first Olympus, begat Alci and called the goddess Sibylle after herself, and Corybas gave the name of Corybunce to all who, in celebrating the rites of his mother, acted like men possessed, and married Thabe, the daughter of Silix. In like manner he also transferred the flute from Samothrace to Phrygia and to Lernessus the lyre which Hermes gave and which at a later time Achilles took for himself when he sacked that city. To Aesian and Demeter, according to the story the myth relate, was born Plutus or wealth, but the reference is, as a matter of fact, to the wealth of the corn, which was presented to Iasian because of Demeter's association with him at the time of the wedding of Harmonia. Now the details of the initiatory rite are guarded among the matters not to be divulged and are communicated to the initiates alone, but the fame has travelled wide of how these gods appear to mankind and bring unexpected aid to those initiates of theirs who call upon them in the midst of perils. The claim is also made that men who have taken part in the mysteries become both more pious and more just and better in every respect than they were before. And this is the reason, we are told, why the most famous both of the ancient heroes and of the demigods were eagerly desirous of taking part in the initiatory rite, and in fact Jason and the Dioscori, and Heracles, and Orpheus as well, after their initiation attained success in all the campaigns they undertook, because these gods appeared to them. Since we have set forth the facts concerning Samothrace, we shall now, in accordance with our plan, discuss Naxos. This island was first called Strangile and its first settlers were men from Thrace, the reasons for their coming being somewhat as follows. The myth relates that two sons, Butes and Lycurgus, were born to Boreas, but not by the same mother, and Butes, who was the younger, formed a plot against his brother, and on being discovered he received no punishment from Lycurgus beyond that he was ordered by Lycurgus to gather ships and, together with his accomplices in the plot, to seek out another land in which to make his home. Consequently Butes, together with the Thracians who were implicated with him, set forth, and making his way through the islands of the Cyclades he seized the island of Strangile, where he made his home and proceeded to plunder many of those who sailed past the island. And since they had no women they sailed here and there and seized them from the land. Now some of the islands of the Cyclades had no inhabitants whatsoever, and others were sparsely settled, consequently they sailed further, and having been repulsed once from Euboea, they sailed to Thessaly where Butes and his companions, upon landing, came upon the female devotees of Dionys as they were celebrating the orgies of the god near Dryas, as it is called, in Achaea Thyotis. As Butes and his companions rushed at the women, these threw away the sacred objects, and some of them fled for safety to the sea, and others to the mountain called Dias, but Coronus, the myth continues, was seized by Butes and forced to lie with him. And she, in anger at the seizure and at the insolent treatment she had received, called upon Dionys to lend her his aid. And the god struck Butes with madness, because of which he lost his mind and, throwing himself into a well, met his death. But the rest of the Thracians seized some of the other women, the most renowned of whom were Iphimedea, the wife of Aluus, and Pancratis, her daughter, and taking these women along with them, 
they sailed off to Strangile. And in place of Butes the Thracians made Agassamine as king of the island, and to him they united in marriage Pancratis, the daughter of Aluas, who was a woman of surpassing beauty, for, before their choice fell on Agassaminus, the most renowned among their leaders, Cicelus and Hesitorus, had quarrelled over Pancratis and had slain each other. And Agassaminus appointed one of his friends his lieutenant and united Iphimedea to him in marriage. Aluas dispatched his sons Otus and Ephialtes in search of his wife and daughter, and they, sailing to Strangile, defeated the Thracians in battle and reduced the city. Some time afterward Pancratis died, and Otus and Ephialtes essayed to take the island for their dwelling and to rule over the Thracians, and they changed the name of the island to Dia. But at a later time they quarrelled among themselves, and joining battle they slew many of the other combatants and then destroyed one another, and from that time on these two men have received at the hands of the natives the honours accorded to heroes. The Thracians dwelt on the island for more than two hundred years and then were driven out of it by a succession of droughts and after that Carians removed to the island from Latmia, as it is now called, and made it their home. Their king was Naxos, the son of Polmon, and he called the island Naxos after himself, in place of Dia. Naxos was an upright and famous man and left behind him a son Lucippus, whose son Smerdius became king of the island. And it was during the reign of Smerdius that Theseus, on his voyage back from Crete together with Ariadne, was entertained as a guest by the inhabitants of the island, and Theseus, seeing in a dream Dionysus threatening him if he would not forsake Ariadne in favour of the god, left her behind him there in his fear and sailed away. And Dionysus led Ariadne away by night to the mountain which is known as Dryas, and first of all the god disappeared, and later Ariadne also was never seen again. The myth which the Naxians have to relate about Dionysus is like this, he was reared, they say, in their country, and for this reason the island has been most dear to him and is called by some Dionysus. For according to the myth which has been handed down to us, Zeus, on the occasion when Samiel had been slain by his lightning before the time for bearing the child, took the babe and sewed it up within his thigh, and when the appointed time came for its birth, wishing to keep the matter concealed from Hera, he took the babe from his thigh in what is now Naxos and gave it to the nymphs of the island, Philia, Coronis, and Clada, to be reared. The reason Zeus slew Samiel with his lightning before she could give birth to her child was his desire that the babe should be born, not of a mortal woman, but of two immortals, and thus should be immortal from its very birth. And because of the kindness which the inhabitants of Naxos had shown to Dionysus in connection with his rearing they received marks of his gratitude. For the island increased in prosperity and fitted out notable naval forces, and the Naxians were the first to withdraw from the naval forces of Xerxes and to aid in the defeat at sea which the barbarians suffered, and they participated with distinction in the Battle of Platea. Also the wine of the island possesses an excellence which is peculiarly its own and offers proof of the friendship which the god entertains for the island. As for the island which is called Syme and was uninhabited in ancient times, its first settlers were men who came together with Triops, under the leadership of Thonius, the son of Poseidon and Syme, from whom the island received the name it bears. At a later time its king was Nereus, the son of Charops and Aglaia, an unusually handsome man who also took part with Agamemnon in the war against Troy both as ruler of the island and as lord of a part of Cnidia. But after the period of the Trojan War Carian seized the island, during the time when they were rulers of the sea. At a later time, however, when droughts came, the Carians fled the island and made their home in Uranium, as it is called. Thereupon Syme continued to be uninhabited, until the expedition which the Lacedaemonians and the Argives made came to these parts, and at that time the island became settled again in the following manner. One of the companions of Hippotes, a certain Norsus by name, was a member of the colony and taking those who had come too late to share in the allotment of the land he settled Syme, which was uninhabited at that time, and later, when certain other men, under the leadership of Zuthus, put in at the island, he gave them a share in the citizenship and in the land, and all of them in common settled the island. And we are told that both Nidians and Rhodians were members of this colony. Calidna and Niceros were settled in ancient times by Carians, and after that Thetelus, the son of Heracles, took possession of both islands. And this explains why both Antiphus and Phidippus, who were kings of the Coans, in the expedition against Troy led those who sailed from the two islands just mentioned. And on the return from Troy for of Agamemnon's ships were wrecked off Calidna, and the survivors mingled with the natives of the island and made their home there.
the ancient inhabitants of Nisiros were destroyed by earthquakes, and at a later time the Kohans settled the island, as they had done in the case of Kalidna, and after that, when an epidemic had carried away the population of the island, the Rhodians dispatched colonists to it. As for Carpathos, its first inhabitants were certain men who joined with Minos in his campaigns at the time when he was the first of the Greeks to be master of the sea, and many generations later Iolcus, the son of Demoleon, an Argive by ancestry, in obedience to a certain oracle dispatched a colony to Carpathos. The island which is called Rhodes was first inhabited by the people who were known as Telchines, these were children of the latter, as the mythical tradition tells us, and the myth relates that they, together with Kephaira, the daughter of Oceanus, nurtured Poseidon, whom Rhea had committed as a babe to their care. And we are told that they were also the discoverers of certain arts and that they introduced other things which are useful for the life of mankind. They were also the first, men say, to fashion statues of gods, and some of the ancient images of gods have been named after them, so, for example, among the Lindians there is an Apollo Telkinius, as it is called, among the Iolisians a Hera and Nymphi, both called Telkinian, and among the Chimerans a Hera Telkinia. And men say that the Telchines were also wizards and could summon clouds and rain and hail at their will and likewise could even bring snow, these things, the accounts tell us. They could do even as could the Magi of Persia. And they could also change their natural shapes and were jealous of teaching their arts to others. Poseidon, the myth continues, when he had grown to manhood, became enamoured of Halia, the sister of the Telchines, and lying with her he begat six male children and one daughter, called Rhodos, after whom the island was named. And at this period in the eastern parts of the island there sprung up the giants, as they were called, and at the time when Zeus is said to have subdued the Titans, he became enamoured of one of the nymphs, Himalia by name, and begat by her three sons, Spartius, Cronius, and Cytus. And while these were still young men, Aphrodite, they say, as she was journeying from Scythery to Cyprus and dropped anchor near Rhodes, was prevented from stopping there by the sons of Poseidon, who were arrogant and insolent men, whereupon the goddess, in her wrath, brought a madness upon them, and they lay with their mother against her will and committed many acts of violence upon the natives. But when Poseidon learned of what had happened he buried his sons beneath the earth because of their shameful deed, and men called them the Eastern demons, and Halia cast herself into the sea, and she was afterwards given the name of Leucothea, and attained to immortal honour in the eyes of the natives. At a later time, the myth continues, the Telchines, perceiving in advance the flood that was going to come, forsook the island and were scattered. Of their number Lycus went to Lycia, and dedicated there beside the Xanthus river a temple of Apollo Lysias. And when the flood came the rest of the inhabitants perished. And since the waters, because of the abundant rains, overflowed the island, its level parts were turned into stagnant pools, but a few fled for refuge to the upper regions of the island and were saved, the sons of Zeus being among their number. Helios, the myth tells us, becoming enamoured of Rhodos, named the island Rhodes after her and caused the water which had overflowed it to disappear. But the true explanation is that, while in the first forming of the world the island was still like mud and soft, the sun dried up the larger part of its wetness and filled the land with living creatures, and there came into being the Heliadae, who were named after him, seven in number, and other peoples who were, like them, sprung from the land itself. In consequence of these events the island was considered to be sacred to Helios, and the Rhodians of later times made it their practice to honour Helios above all the other gods. As the ancestor and founder from whom they were descended, his seven sons were Ochimus, Circaphus, Makar, Actis, Tenages, Triopar, and Candelus, and there was one daughter, Electrione, who quit this life while still a maiden and attained at the hands of the Rhodians to honours like those accorded to the heroes. And when the Heliadae attained to manhood they were told by Helios that the first people to offer sacrifices to Athena would ever enjoy the presence of the goddess, and the same thing, we are told, was disclosed by him to the inhabitants of Attica. Consequently, men say, the Heliadae, forgetting in their haste to put fire beneath the victims, nevertheless laid them on the altars at the time, whereas Cecrops, who was king at the time of the Athenians, performed the sacrifice over fire, but later than the Heliadae. This is the reason, men say, why the peculiar practice as regards the manner of sacrificing persists in Rhodes to this day, and why the goddess has her seat on the island. Such, then, is the account which certain writers of myths give about the antiquities of the Rhodians, one of them being Zenon, who has composed a history of the island. The Heliadae, besides having shown themselves superior to all other men, 
likewise surpassed them in learning and especially in astrology, and they introduced many new practices in seamanship and established the division of the day into hours. The most highly endowed of them by nature was Tenage, who was slain by his brothers because of their envy of him, but when their treacherous act became known, all who had had a hand in the murder took to flight. Of their number Makar came to Lesbos, and Candelus to Kos, and Actes, sailing off to Egypt, founded there the city men call Heliopolis, naming it after his father. And it was from him that the Egyptians learned the laws of astrology. But when at a later time there came a flood among the Greeks and the majority of mankind perished by reason of the abundance of rain, it came to pass that all written monuments were also destroyed in the same manner as mankind, and this is the reason why the Egyptians, seizing the favourable occasion, appropriated to themselves the knowledge of astrology, and why, since the Greeks, because of their ignorance, no longer laid any claim to writing, the belief prevailed that the Egyptians were the first men to effect the discovery of the stars. Likewise the Athenians, although they were the founders of the city in Egypt men called Sais, suffered from the same ignorance because of the flood. And it was because of reasons such as these that many generations later men supposed that Cadmus, the son of Age Nor, had been the first to bring the letters from Phoenicia to Greece. And after the time of Cadmus onwards the Greeks were believed to have kept making new discoveries in the science of writing. Since a sort of general ignorance of the facts possessed the Greeks, Triopar sailed to Caria and seized a promontory which was called Triopium after him. But the rest of the sons of Helios, since they had had no hand in the murder, remained behind in Rhodes and made their homes in the territory of Ialysus, where they founded the city of Achaea. Ochimus, who was the oldest of them and their king, married Hegetoria, one of the nymphs of that region, and begat by her a daughter Sadeep, whose name was afterwards changed to Serbia, and Circaphus, another of the brothers, married Serbia and succeeded to the throne. Upon the death of Circaphus his three sons, Lindus, Aialysus, and Camerus, succeeded to the supreme power, and during their lifetime there came a great deluge and Serb was buried beneath the flood and laid waste, whereupon the three divided the land among themselves, and each of them founded a city which bore his name. About this time Danus together with his daughters fled from Egypt, and when he put ashore at Lindus in Rhodes and received the kindly welcome of the inhabitants, he established there a temple of Athena and dedicated in it a statue of the goddess. Of the daughters of Danus three died during their stay in Lindus, but the rest sailed on to Argos together with their father Danus. And a little after this time Cadmus, the son of Age Nor, having been dispatched by the king to seek out Europe, put ashore at Rhodes. He had been severely buffeted by tempests during the voyage and had taken a vow to found a temple to Poseidon, and so, since he had come through with his life, he founded in the island a sacred precinct to this god and left there certain of the Phoenicians to serve as its overseers. These men mingled with the Iolisians and continued to live as fellow citizens with them, and from them, we are told. The priests were drawn who succeeded to the priestly office by heredity. Now Cadmus honoured likewise the Lindian Athena with votive offerings, one of which was a striking bronze cauldron worked after the ancient manner, and this carried an inscription in Phoenician letters, which, men say, were first brought from Phoenicia to Greece. Subsequent to these happenings, when the land of Rhodes brought forth huge serpents, it came to pass that the serpents caused the death of many of the natives, consequently the survivors dispatched men to Delos to inquire of the god how they might rid themselves of the evil and Apollo commanded them to receive Forbes and his companions and to colonize together with them the island of Rhodes. Forbes was a son of Lapiths and was tarrying in Thessaly together with a considerable number of men, seeking a land in which he might make his home, and the Rhodians summoned him as the oracle had commanded and gave him a share in the land. And Forbes destroyed the serpents, and after he had freed the island of its fear he made his home in Rhodes. Furthermore, since in other respects he proved himself a great and good man, after his death he was accorded honours like those offered to heroes. At a later time than the events we have described Althemenes, the son of Catrius the king of Crete, while inquiring of the oracle regarding certain other matters, received the reply that it was fated that he should slay his father by his own hand. So wishing to avoid such an abominable act, he fled of his own free will from Crete together with such as desired to sail away with him, these being a considerable company. Althemenes, then, put ashore on Rhodes at Camerus, and on Mount Atabirus he founded a temple of Zeus who is called Zeus Atabirius, and for this reason the temple is held in special honour even to this day, situated as it is upon a lofty peak from which one can descry Crete. So Althemenes with his companions made his home in Camerus, being held in honour by the natives, but his father Catrius, having no male children at home and dearly loving Althemenes, sailed to Rhodes, 
being resolved upon finding his son and bringing him back to Crete. And now the fated destiny prevailed, Catrius disembarked by night upon the land of Rhodes with a few followers. And when there arose a hand-to-hand -hand conflict between them and the natives, Althemenes, rushing out to aid them, hurled his spear, and struck in ignorance his father and killed him. And when he realized what he had done, Althemenes, being unable to bear his great affliction, shunned all meetings and association with mankind, and betook himself to unfrequented places, and wandered about alone, until the grief put an end to his life, and at a later time he received at the hands of the Rhodians, as a certain oracle had commanded, the honours which are accorded to heroes. Shortly before the Trojan war Tlepolemus, the son of Heracles, who was a fugitive because of the death of Lysimnius, whom he had unwittingly slain, fled of his free will from Argos, and upon receiving an oracular response regarding where he should go to found a settlement, he put ashore at Rhodes together with a few people, and being kindly received by the inhabitants he made his home there. And becoming king of the whole island he portioned out the land in equal allotments and continued in other respects as well to rule equitably. And in the end, when he was on the point of taking part with Agamemnon in the war against Ilium, he put the rule of Rhodes in the hands of Butas, who had accompanied him in his flight from Argos, and he gained great fame for himself in the war and met his death in the Trode. Since the affairs of Rhodes, as it happened, became interwoven with certain events occurring in the Cheronesus, which lies opposite the island, I think it will not be foreign to my purpose to discuss the latter. The Cheronesus, as some men say, received in ancient times the name it bears from the fact that the natural shape of the region is that of an isthmus, but others have written that the name Cheronesus is given it from the man who once ruled over those parts. The account runs like this, not long after Cheronesus had ruled, five curettes passed over to it from Crete, and these were descendants of those who had received Zeus from his mother Rhea and had nurtured him in the mountains of Ide in Crete. And sailing to the Cheronesus with a notable expedition, they expelled the Carians who dwelt there, and settling down in the land themselves they divided it into five parts. Each of them founding a city which he named after himself. Not long after this Inachus, the king of the Argives, since his daughter Io had disappeared, sent forth Cernus, one of his men in high command, fitting him out with a considerable fleet, and ordered him to hunt for Io in every region and not to return unless he had got possession of her. And Cernus, after having wandered over many parts of the inhabited world without being able to find her, put ashore in Caria on the Cheronesus we are discussing, and despairing of ever returning to his house, he made his home in the Cheronesus, where, partly by persuasive means and partly by the use of force, he became king of a part of the land and founded a city which bore his name Cernus. And by administering affairs in a popular fashion he enjoyed great favour among his fellow citizens. After this, the account continues, Triopar, one of the sons of Helios and Rhodos, who was a fugitive because of the murder of his brother Tenage, came to the Cheronesus. And after he had been purified there of the murder by Elysius the king, he sailed to Thessaly to give assistance as an ally to the sons of Deucalion, and with their aid he expelled from Thessaly the Pelasgians and took for his portion the plain which is called Dosham. There he cut down the sacred grove of Demeter and used the wood to build a palace, and for this reason he incurred the hatred of the natives, whereupon he fled from Thessaly and put ashore, together with the peoples who sailed with him, in the territory of Nidus, where he founded Triopium, as it was called after him. And setting out from this place as his base he won for himself both the Cheronesus and a large part of neighbouring Caria. But as regards the ancestry of Triopar there is disagreement among many of the historians and poets. For some have recorded that he was the son of Canash, the daughter of Elis and Poseidon, but others that he was born of Lapiths, the son of Apollo, and Stilbe, the daughter of Peneus. In Castabus, on the Cheronesus, there is a temple which is sacred to Hemithea, and there is no reason why we should omit to mention the strange occurrence which befell this goddess. Now many and various accounts have been handed down regarding her, but we shall recount that which has prevailed and is in accord with what the natives relate. To Staphylus and Chrysothemes were born three daughters, Molpadia, Roo, and Parthenos by name. Apollo lay with Roo and brought her with child, and her father, believing that her seduction was due to a man, was angered, and in his anger he shut up his daughter in a chest and cast her into the sea. But the chest was washed up upon Delos, where she gave birth to a male child and called the babe Aeneas. And Roo, who had been saved from death in this unexpected manner, laid the babe upon the altar of Apollo and prayed to the god to save its life if it was his child. Thereupon Apollo, the myth relates, concealed the child for the time, but afterwards he gave thought to its rearing, instructed it in divination, 
and conferred upon it certain great honours. And the other sisters of the maiden who had been seduced, namely, Molpadia and Parthenos, while watching their father's wine, a drink which had only recently been discovered among men, fell asleep, and while they were asleep some swine which they were keeping entered in, and broke the jar which contained the wine, and so destroyed the wine. And the maidens, when they learned what had happened, in fear of their father's severity fled to the edge of the sea, and hurled themselves down from some lofty rocks. But Apollo, because of his affection for their sister, rescued the maidens, and established them in the cities of the Cheronesus. The one named Parthenos, as the god brought it to pass, enjoyed honours and a sacred precinct in Bubastus of the Cheronesus, while Molpadia, who came to Castabus, was given the name Hemithea, because the god had appeared to men, and she was honoured by all who dwelt in the Cheronesus. And in sacrifices, which are held in her honour a mixture of honey and milk is used in the libations. Because of the experience which she had had in connection with the wine. While anyone who has touched a hog or eaten of its flesh is not permitted to draw near to the sacred precinct. In later times, the temple of Hemithea enjoyed so great a development that not only was it held in special honor by the inhabitants of the place and of neighboring regions, but even peoples from afar came to it in their devotion and honored it with costly sacrifices and notable dedications. And most important of all, when the Persians were the dominant power in Asia and were plundering all the temples of the Greeks, the precinct of Hemithea was the sole shrine on which they did not lay hands, and the robbers who were pillaging everything they met left this shrine alone entirely unplundered, and this they did despite the fact that it was unwalled and the pillaging of it would have entailed no danger. And the reason which men advance for its continued development is the benefactions, which the goddess confers upon all mankind alike, for she appears in visible shape in their sleep to those who are in suffering and gives them healing. And many who are in the grip of diseases for which no remedy is known are restored to health. Furthermore, to women who are suffering in childbirth the goddess gives relief from the agony and perils of travail. Consequently, since many have been saved in these ways from most ancient times, the sacred precinct is filled with votive offerings, nor are these protected by guards or by a strong wall, but by the habitual reverence of the people. Now as regards Rhodes and the Cheronesus, we shall rest content with what has been said, and we shall at this point discuss Crete. The inhabitants of Crete claim that the oldest people of the island were those who are known as Etiocritans, who were sprung from the soil itself, and that their king, who was called Crescent, was responsible for the greatest number of the most important discoveries made in the island which contributed to the improvement of the social life of mankind. Also the greater number of the gods who, because of their benefactions to all men alike, have been accorded immortal honours, had their origin, so their myths relate, in their land, and of the tradition regarding these gods, we shall now give a summary account, following the most reputable writers who have recorded the affairs of Crete. The first of these gods of whom tradition has left a record made their home in Crete about Mount Ide and were called Idean Dactyli. These, according to one tradition, were one hundred in number, but others say that there were only ten to receive this name, corresponding in number to the fingers, Dactyli, of the hands. But some historians, and Ephraim is one of them, record that the Idean Dactyli were in fact born on the Mount Ide which is in Phrygia and passed over to Europe together with Migdon, and since they were wizards, they practiced charms and initiatory rites and mysteries, and in the course of a sojourn in Samothrace, they amazed the natives of that island not a little by their skill in such matters. And it was at this time, we are further told, that Orpheus, who was endowed with an exceptional gift of poesy and song, also became a pupil of theirs, and he was subsequently the first to introduce initiatory rites and mysteries to the Greeks. However this may be, the Idean Dactyli of Crete, so tradition tell us, discovered both the use of fire and what the metals copper and iron are, as well as the means of working them, this being done in the territory of the city of Aptera at Berecynthus, as it is called, and since they were looked upon as the originators of great blessings for the race of men, they were accorded immortal honours. And writers tell us that one of them was named Heracles, and excelling as he did in fame, he established the Olympic Games, and that the men of a later period thought, because the name was the same, that it was the son of Alcmene who had founded the institution of the Olympic Games. And evidences of this, they tell us, are found in the fact that many women even to this day take their incantations from this god and make amulets in his name, on the ground that he was a wizard and practiced the arts of initiatory rites. But they add that these things were indeed very far removed from the habits of the Heracles who was born of Alcmene. After the Idean Dactyli, according to accounts we have, there were nine curettes. Some writers of myths relate that these gods were born of the earth, 
but according to others, they were descended from the Idean Dactyli. The home they made in mountainous places, which were thickly wooded and full of ravines, and which, in a word, provided a natural shelter and coverage, since it had not yet been discovered how to build houses. And since these curettes excelled in wisdom, they discovered many things which are of use to men generally, so, for instance, they were the first to gather sheep into flocks, to domesticate the several other kinds of animals which men fatten, and to discover the making of honey. In the same manner they introduced the art of shooting with the bow and the ways of hunting animals, and they showed mankind how to live and associate together in a common life, and they were the originators of concord and, so to speak, of orderly behaviour. The curettes also invented swords and helmets and the war dance, by means of which they raised a great alarum and deceived Cronus. And we are told that, when Rhea, the mother of Zeus, entrusted him to them unbeknown to Cronus his father, they took him under their care and saw to his nurture, but since we purpose to set forth this affair in detail, we must take up the account at a little earlier point. The myth the Cretans relate runs like this, when the curettes were young men, the Titans, as they are called, were still living. These Titans had their dwelling in the land about Gnosis, at the place where even to this day men point out foundations of a house of Rhea and a cypress grove, which has been consecrated to her from ancient times. The Titans numbered six men and five women, being born, as certain writers of myth relate, of Uranus and Ge. But according to others, of one of the Curettes and Titia, from whom as their mother they derive the name they have. The males were Cronus, Hyperion, Coeus, Iapetus, Crius, and Oceanus, and their sisters were Rhea, the Miss, Memosine, Phoebe, and Tessis. Each one of them was the discoverer of things of benefit to mankind, and because of the benefaction they conferred upon all men they were accorded honours and everlasting fame. Cronus, since he was the eldest of the Titans, became king and caused all men who were his subjects to change from a rude way of living to a civilized life and visited many regions of the inhabited earth. Among all he met he introduced justice and sincerity of soul, and this is why the tradition has come down to later generations that the men of Cronus' time were good-hearted, altogether guileless, and blessed with felicity. His kingdom was strongest in the western regions, where indeed he enjoyed his greatest honour, consequently, down even to comparatively recent times, among the Romans and the Carthaginians, while their city still stood, and other neighbouring peoples, notable festivals, and sacrifices, were celebrated in honour of this god and many places bore his name. And because of the exceptional obedience to laws no injustice was committed by any one at any time and all the subjects of the rule of Cronus lived a life of blessedness in the unhindered enjoyment of every pleasure. To this the poet Hesiod also bears witness in the following words, and they who were of Cronus' day, what time he reigned in Heven, lived like the gods, no care in heart, remote and free from ills and toil severe, from grievous sicknesses and cares. Old age lay not upon their limbs, but they, equal in strength of leg and arm, enjoyed endless delight of feasting far from ills. And when death came, they sank in it as in a sleep, and many other things were theirs, grain-giving earth, unploughed, bore for them fruit abundantly and without stint, and glad of heart, they dwelt upon their till throughout the earth, in midst of blessings manifold. Rich in their flocks, loved by the blessed gods. This, then, is what the myths have to say about Cronus. Of Hyperion we are told that he was the first to understand, by diligent attention and observation, the movement of both the sun and the moon and the other stars and the seasons as well, in that they are caused by these bodies, and to make these facts known to others, and that for this reason he was called the father of these bodies, since he had begotten, so to speak, the speculation about them and their nature. To Coeus and Phoebe was born Leto, and to Iapetus was born Prometheus, of whom tradition tells us, as some writers of myth's record, that he stole fire from the gods and gave it to mankind, though the truth is that he was the discoverer of those things which give forth fire and from which it may be kindled. Of the female titans, they say that Memosine discovered the uses of the power of reason, and that she gave a designation to every object about us by means of the names which we use to express whatever we would and to hold conversation with another, though there are those who attribute these discoveries to Hermes. And to this goddess is also attributed the power to call things to memory and to remembrance a meme, which men possess. And it is this power which gave her the name she received. The Miss, the myths tell us, was the first to introduce divinations and sacrifices and the ordinances which concern the gods and to instruct men in the ways of obedience to laws and of peace.
consequently men who preserve what is holy with respect to the gods and the laws of men are called law guardians, the smarphalakes, and lawgivers, thesmothetai, and we say that Apollo, at the moment when he is to return the oracular responses, is issuing laws and ordinances, themistuin, in view of the fact that the miss was the discoveress of oracular responses. And so these gods, by reason of the many benefactions which they conferred upon the life of man, were not only accorded immortal honours, but it was also believed that they were the first to make their home on Mount Olympus after they had been translated from among men. To Cronus and Rhea, we are told, were born Hestia, Demeter, and Hera, and Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. Of these, they say, Hestia discovered how to build houses, and because of this benefaction of hers practically all men have established her shrine in every home, according her honours and sacrifices. And Demeter, since the corn still grew wild together with the other plants and was still unknown to men, was the first to gather it in, to devise how to prepare and preserve it, and to instruct mankind how to sow it. Now she had discovered the corn before she gave birth to her daughter Persephone, but after the birth of her daughter and the rape of her by Pluton, she burned all the fruit of the corn, both because of her anger at Zeus and because of her grief over her daughter. After she had found Persephone, However, she became reconciled with Zeus and gave Triptolemus the corn to sow, instructing him both to share the gift with men everywhere and to teach them everything concerned with the labour of sowing. And some men say that it was she also who introduced laws, by obedience to which men have become accustomed to deal justly with one another, and that mankind has called this goddess Thesmophoros after the laws which she gave them. And since Demeter has been responsible for the greatest blessings to mankind, she has been accorded the most notable honours and sacrifices, and magnificent feasts and festivals as well, not only by the Greeks, but also by almost all barbarians who have partaken of this kind of food. There is dispute about the discovery of the fruit of the corn on the part of many peoples, who claim that they were the first among whom the goddess was seen and to whom she made known both the nature and use of the corn. The Egyptians, for example say that Demeter and Isis are the same, and that she was first to bring the sea to Egypt, since the river Nile waters the fields at the proper time and that land enjoys the most temperate seasons. Also the Athenians, though they assert that the discovery of this fruit took place in their country, are nevertheless witnesses to its having been brought to Attica from some other region, for the place which originally received this gift they call Eleusis, from the fact that the seed of the corn came from others and was conveyed to them. But the inhabitants of Sicily, dwelling as they do on an island which is sacred to Demeter and Cor, say that it is reasonable to believe that the gift of which we are speaking was made to them first, since the land they cultivate is the one the goddess holds most dear, for it would be strange indeed, they maintain, for the goddess to take for her own, so to speak, a land which is the most fertile known and yet to give it. The last of all, a share in her benefaction, as though it were nothing to her, especially since she has her dwelling there all men agreeing that the rape of Kor took place on this island. Moreover, this land is the best adapted for these fruits, even as the poet also says, but all these things grow there for them unsown and e'en and tilled, both wheat and barley. This, then, is what the myths have to say about Demeter. As for the rest of the gods who were born to Cronus and Rhea, the Cretans say that Poseidon was the first to concern himself with seafaring and to fit out fleets, Cronus having given him the lordship in such matters, and this is why the tradition has been passed along to succeeding generations that he controls whatever is done on the sea, and why mariners honour him by means of sacrifices. Men further bestow upon Poseidon the distinction of having been the first to tame horses and to introduce the knowledge of horsemanship, Hippike, because of which he is called Hippias. And of Hades it is said that he laid down the rules which are concerned with burials and funerals and the honours which are paid to the dead, no concern having been given to the dead before this time, and this is why tradition tells us that Hades is lord of the dead, since there were assigned to him in ancient times the first offices in such matters and the concern for them. Regarding the birth of Zeus and the manner in which he came to be king, there is no agreement. Some say that he succeeded to the kingship after Cronus passed from among men into the company of the gods, not by overcoming his father with violence, but in the manner prescribed by custom and justly, having been judged worthy of that honour. But others recount a myth, which runs as follows, there was delivered to Cronus an oracle regarding the birth of Zeus, which stated that the son who would be born to him would wrest the kingship from him by force. Consequently Cronus time and again did away with the children whom he begot, but Rhea grieved as she was, and yet lacking the power to change her husband's purpose, when she had given birth to Zeus, concealed him in Ide, as it is called, 
and, without the knowledge of Cronus, entrusted the rearing of him to the curettes who dwelt in the neighborhood of Mount Ide. The curettes bore him off to a certain cave where they gave him over to the nymphs, with the command that they should minister to his every need. And the nymphs nurtured the child on a mixture of honey and milk and gave him upbringing at the udder of the goat which was named Amalthea. And many evidences of the birth and upbringing of this god remain to this day on the island. For instance, when he was being carried away, while still an infant, by the curettes, they say that the umbilical cord, omphalos, fell from him near the river known as Triton. And that this spot has been made sacred and has been called omphalos after that incident, while in like manner the plain about it is known as Omphalium. And on Mount Ide, where the god was nurtured, both the cave in which he spent his days has been made sacred to him, and the meadows round about it, which lie upon the ridges of the mountain, have in like manner been consecrated to him. But the most astonishing of all that which the myth relates has to do with the bees, and we should not omit to mention it, the god, they say, wishing to preserve an immortal memorial of his close association with the bees, changed the colour of them, making it like copper with a gleam of gold, and since the region lay at a very great altitude, where fierce winds blew about it and heavy snows fell, he made the bees insensible to such things and unaffected by them, since they must range over the most wintry stretches. To the goat, A.E.G., which suckled him Zeus also accorded certain honours, and in particular took from it a surname, being called Egeocus. And when he had attained to manhood he founded first a city in Dicta, where indeed the myth states that he was born, in later times this city was abandoned, but some stone blocks of its foundations are still preserved. Now Zeus, the myth goes on to say, surpassed all others in manly spirit and wisdom and justice and in the other virtues one and all, and, as a consequence, when he took over the kingly power from Cronus, he conferred benefactions of the greatest number and importance upon the life of mankind. He was the first of all, for instance, to lay down rules regarding acts of injustice and to teach men to deal justly one with another, to refrain from deeds of violence, and to settle their differences by appeals to men and to courts of justice. In short, he contributed in abundance to the practices which are concerned with obedience to law and with peace, prevailing upon good men by persuasion and intimidating evil men by threat of punishment and by their fear. He also visited practically the entire inhabited earth, putting to death robbers and impious men and introducing equality and democracy, and it was in this connection, they say, that he slew the giants and their followers. Mylinus in Crete and Typhon in Phrygia. Before the battle against the giants in Crete, we are told, Zeus sacrificed a bull to Helios and to Uranus and to Ge, and in connection each of the rites, there was revealed to him what was the will of the gods in the affair, the omens indicating the victory of the gods and a defection to them of the enemy. And the outcome of the war accorded with the omens, for Musaeus deserted to him from the enemy, for which he was accorded peculiar honours, and all who opposed them were cut down by the gods. Zeus also had other wars against the giants, we are told, in Macedonia near Palene and in Italy on the plain which of old was named Phlegraean, fiery, after the region about it which had been burned, but which in later times men called Cumean. Now the giants were punished by Zeus because they had treated the rest of mankind in a lawless fashion and, confiding in their bodily superiority and strength, had enslaved their neighbours, and because they were also disobeying the rules of justice which he was laying down and were raising up war against those whom all mankind considered to be gods because of the benefactions they were conferring upon men generally. Zeus, then, we are told, not only totally eradicated the impious and evildoers from among mankind, but he also distributed honours as they were merited among the noblest of the gods and heroes and men. And because of the magnitude of his benefactions and his superior power all men accorded to him as with one voice both the everlasting kingship which he possesses and his dwelling upon Mount Olympus. And it was ordained, the myth continues, that sacrifices should be offered to Zeus surpassing those offered to all the other gods, and that, after he passed from earth into the heavens, a just belief should spring up in the souls of all who had received his benefactions that he is lord of all the phenomena of heaven, that is, both of rain, and of thunder, and of lightning, and of everything else of that nature. It is for this reason also that names have been given him, Zen, because in the opinion of mankind he is the cause of life, Zen, as he does the fruits to maturity by tempering the atmosphere, Father, because of the concern and goodwill he manifests toward all mankind, as well as, because he is considered to be the first cause of the race of men, most high and king, because of the preeminence of his rule, good counsellor and all wise, because of the sagacity he manifests in the giving of wise counsel.
Athena, the myth relate, was likewise begotten of Zeus in Crete, at the sources of the river Triton, this being the reason why she has been given the name Tritogenia. And there stands, even to this day, at these sources a temple which is sacred to this goddess, at the spot where the myth relates that her birth took place. Men say also that the marriage of Zeus and Hera was held in the territory of the Nosians, at a place near the river the Ren, where now a temple stands in which the natives of the place annually offer holy sacrifices and imitate the ceremony of the marriage, in the manner in which with tradition tells it was originally performed. To Zeus also were born, they say, the goddesses Aphrodite and the graces, Ilithia, and her helper Artemis, the Hours, as they are called, Eunomia and Dicanerine, and Athena, and the Muses, and the gods Hephaestus and Ars and Apollo, and Hermes and Dionys and Heracles. To each one of the deities we have named, the myth goes on to relate, Zeus imparted the knowledge of the things which he had discovered and was perfecting, and likewise assigned to them the honour of their discovery, wishing in this way were to endow them with immortal fame among all mankind. To Aphrodite was entrusted the youth of maidens, the years in which they are expected to marry, and the supervision of such matters as are observed even yet in connection with weddings, together with the sacrifices and drink offerings which men perform to this goddess. Nevertheless, all men make their first sacrifices to Zeus the Perfector and Herald the Perfectress, because they are the originators and discoverers of all things, as we have stated above. To the graces was given the adornment of personal appearance and the beautifying of each part of the body with an eye to making it more comely and pleasing to the gaze. And the further privilege of being the first to bestow benefactions and, on the other hand, of requiting with appropriate favours such men as have performed good acts. Ilithia received the care of expectant mothers and the alleviation of the travail of childbirth, and for this reason women when they are in perils of this nature call first of all upon this goddess. And Artemis, we are told, discovered how to affect the healing of young children and the foods which are suitable to the nature of babes, this being the reason why she is also called Corotrophos. And as for the hours, as they are called, to each of them, according as her name indicates, was given the ordering and adornment of life, so as to serve to the greatest advantage of mankind, for there is nothing which is better able to build a life of felicity than obedience to law, eunomia, and justice, dyke, and peace, Irene. To Athena men ascribe the gift to mankind of the domestication and cultivation of the olive tree, as well as the preparation of its fruit, for before the birth of this goddess this kind of tree was found only along with the other wild woody growths, and this goddess is the source of the care and the experience which men even to this day devote to these trees. Furthermore, Athena introduced among mankind the making of clothing and carpentry and many of the devices which are used in the other arts, and she also was the discoverer of the making of the pipes and of the music which they produce and, in a word, of many works of cunning device, from which she derives her name of worker. To the muses, we are further told, it was given by their father Zeus to discover the letters and to combine words in the way which is designated poetry. And in reply to those who say that the Syrians are the discoverers of the letters, the Phoenicians having learned them from the Syrians, and then passed them on to the Greeks, and that these Phoenicians are those who sailed to Europe together with Cadmus, and this is the reason why the Greeks call the letters Phoenician, men tell us, on the other hand, that the Phoenicians were not the first to make this discovery, but that they did no more than to change the forms of the letters. Whereupon the majority of mankind made use of the way of writing them as the Phoenicians devised it, and so the letters received the designation we have mentioned above. Hephaestus, we are told, was the discoverer of every manner of working iron and copper and gold and silver and everything else which requires fire for working, and he also discovered all the other uses to be made of fire and turned them over both to the workers in the crafts and to all other men as well. Consequently, the workmen who are skilled in these crafts offer up prayers and sacrifices to this god before all others, and both they and all mankind as well call the fire a Hephaestus, handing down in this way to eternal remembrance and honour the benefaction which was bestowed in the beginning upon man's social life. Ars, the myth's record, was the first to make a suit of armour, to fit out soldiers with arms, and to introduce the battle's fury of contest, slaying himself those who were disobedient to the gods. And of Apollo men recount that he was the discoverer of the lyre, and of the music, which is got from it, that he introduced the knowledge of healing, which is brought about through the faculty of prophecy, whereby it was the practice in ancient times that the sick were healed, and as the discoverer of the bow he taught the people of the land all about the use of the bow, this being the reason why the art of archery is especially cultivated by the Cretans, and the bow is called Cretan. To Apollo and Coronis was born Asclepius, 
who learned from his father many matters which pertain to the healing art, and then went on to discover the art of surgery and the preparations of drugs and the strength to be found in roots, and, speaking generally, he introduced such advances into the healing art that he is honoured as if he were its source and founder. To Hermes men ascribe the introduction of the sending of embassies to sue for peace, as they are used in wars, and negotiations, and truces, and also the herald's wand, as a token of such matters, which is customarily borne by those who are carrying on conversations touching affairs of this kind and who, by means of it, are accorded safe conduct by the enemy, and this is the reason why he has been given the name Hermes Koinos, because the benefit is common, Corini, to both the parties when they exchange peace in time of war. They also say that he was the first to devise measures and weights and the profits to be gained through merchandising, and how also to appropriate the property of others all unknown to them. Tradition also says that he is the herald of the gods and their most trusted messenger because of his ability to express clearly, Hermanuin, each command that has been given him, and this is the reason why he has received the name he bears. Not because he was the discoverer of words and of speech, as some men say, but because he has perfected to a higher degree than all others, the art of the precise and clear statement of a message. He also introduced wrestling schools and invented the lyre out of a tortoiseshell after the contest in skill between Apollo and Marcias, in which, we are told, Apollo was victorious and thereupon exacted an excessive punishment of his defeated adversary, but he afterwards repented of this and, tearing the strings from the lyre, for a time had nothing to do with its music. As for Dionys, the myth state that he discovered the vine and its cultivation, and also how to make wine and to store away many of the autumn fruits and thus to provide mankind with the use of them as food over a long time. This god was born in Crete, men say, of Zeus and Persephone, and Orpheus has handed down the tradition in the initiatory rites that he was torn in pieces by the Titans. And the fact is that there have been several who bore the name Dionys, regarding whom we have given a detailed account at greater length in connection with the more appropriate period of time. The Cretans, however, undertake to advance evidences that the god was born in their country, stating that he formed two islands near Crete in the twin gulfs, as they are called, and called them after himself Dionysiade, a thing which he has done, they say, nowhere else in the inhabited earth. Of Heracles the myths relate that he was sprung from Zeus many years before that Heracles who was born of Alcmean. As for this son of Zeus, tradition has not given us the name of his mother, but only states that he far excelled all others in vigour of body, and that he visited the inhabited earth, inflicting punishment upon the unjust and destroying the wild beasts which were making the land uninhabitable, for men everywhere he won their freedom, while remaining himself unconquered and unwounded, and because of his good deeds he attained to immortal honour at the hands of mankind. The Heracles who was born of Alcmene was very much later, and, since he emulated the plan of life of the ancient Heracles, for the same reasons he attained to immortality, and, as time wore on, he was thought by men to be the same as the other Heracles, because both bore the same name, and the deeds of the earlier Heracles were transferred to the later one. The majority of men being ignorant of the actual facts. And it is generally agreed that the most renowned deeds and honours which belonged to the older god were concerned with Egypt, and that these, together with a city which he founded, are still known in that country. Britomartis, who is also called Dictina, the myth relate, was born at Kino in Crete of Zeus and Calm, the daughter of Eubulus who was the son of Demeter, she invented the nets, Dictia, which are used in hunting, when she has been called Dictina, and she passed her time in the company of Artemis, this being the reason why some men think Dictina and Artemis are one and the same goddess, and the Cretans have instituted sacrifices and built temples in honour of this goddess. But those men who tell the tale that she has been named Dictina because she fled into some fisherman's nets when she was pursued by Minos, who would have ravished her, have missed the truth, for it is not a probable story that the goddess should ever have got into so helpless a state that she would have required the aid that men can give, being as she is the daughter of the greatest one of the gods, nor is it right to ascribe such an impious deed to Minos. Who tradition unanimously declares avowed just principles and strove to attain a manner of life which was approved by men. Plutus we are told, was born in Cretan Tripolis to Demeter and Aesian, and there is a double account of his origin. For some men say that the earth, when it was sowed once by Aesian and given proper cultivation, brought forth such an abundance of fruits that those who saw this bestowed a special name upon the abundance of fruits when they appear and called it Plutus, wealth, consequently it has become traditional among later generations to say that men who have acquired more than they actually need have Plutus. 
but there are some who recount the myth that a son was born to Demeter and Aesian whom they named Plutus, and that he was the first to introduce diligence into the life of man and the acquisition and safeguarding of property, all men up to that time having been neglectful of amassing and guarding diligently any store of property. Such, then, are the myths which the Cretans recount of the gods who they claim were born in their land. They also assert that the honours accorded to the gods and their sacrifices and the initiatory rites observed in connection with the mysteries were handed down from Crete to the rest of men, and to support this they advance the following most weighty argument, as they conceive it, the initiatory rite, which is celebrated by the Athenians in Eleusis, the most famous, one may venture, of them all, and that of Samothrace, and the one practised in Thrace among the Sicones, whence Orpheus, came who introduced them, these are all handed down in the form of a mystery, whereas at Gnosis in Crete it has been the custom for ancient times that these initiatory rites should be handed down to all openly, and what is handed down among other peoples as not to be divulged, this the Cretans conceal from no one who may wish to inform himself upon such matters. Indeed, the majority of the gods, the Cretans say, had their beginning in Crete and set out from there to visit many regions of the inhabited world conferring benefactions upon the races of men and distributing among each of them the advantage which resulted from the discoveries they had made. Demeter, for example, crossed over into Attica and then removed from there to Sicily and afterwards to Egypt, and in these lands her choicest gift was that of the fruit of the corn and instructions in the sowing of it, whereupon she received great honours at the hands of those whom she had benefited. Likewise Aphrodite made her seat in Sicily in the region of Eryx, among the islands near Cythera, and in Paphos in Cyprus, and in Asia in Syria, because of the manifestation of the goddess in their country and her extended sojourn among them the inhabitants of the lands appropriated her to themselves, calling her, as the case might be, Erycinian Aphrodite, and Cytherian, and Paphian, and Syrian. And in the same manner Apollo revealed himself for the longest time in Delos and Lycia and Delphi and Artemis in Ephesus, and the Pontus and Persis and Crete, and the consequence has been that, either from the names of these regions or as a result of the deeds which they performed in each of them, Apollo has been called Delian and Lycian and Pythian, and Aphrodite has been called Ephesian and Cretan and Tauropolian and Persian, although both of them were born in Crete. And this goddess is held in special honour among the Persians, and the barbarians hold mysteries which are performed among other peoples even down to this day in honour of the Persian Artemis. And similar myths are also recounted by the Cretans regarding the other gods, but to draw up an account of them would be a long task for us, and it would not be easily grasped by our readers. Many generations after the birth of the gods, the Cretans go on to say, not a few heroes were to be found in Crete, the most renowned of whom were Minos and Radamanthes and Sarpedon. These men, their myth states, were born of Zeus and Europe, the daughter of Agenor, who, men say, was brought across to Crete upon the back of a bull by the design of the gods. Now Minos, by virtue of his being the eldest, became king of the island, and he founded on it not a few cities, the most renowned of which were the three, Gnosis in those parts of the island which looked toward Asia, Phaestus on the seashore to the south, and Sidonia in the regions to the west facing the Peloponnesus. And Minos established not a few laws for the Cretans, claiming that he had received them from his father Zeus when conversing with him in a certain cave. Furthermore, he came to possess a great naval power, and he subdued the majority of the islands and was the first man among the Greeks to be master of the sea. And after he had gained great renown for his manly spirit and justice, he ended his life in Sicily in the course of his campaign against Cocalus, the details of which we have recounted in connection with our account of Daedalus, because of whom the campaign was made. Of Radamanthes the Cretans say that of all men he rendered the most just decisions and inflicted inexorable punishment upon robbers and impious men and all other malefactors. He came also to possess no small number of islands and a large part of the sea coast of Asia, all men delivering themselves into his hands of their free will because of his justice. Upon Erythrus, one of his sons, Radamanthes bestowed the kingship over the city which was named after him Erythri, and to Enopian, the son of Minos' daughter Ariadne, he gave Chios, we are told, although some writers of myth state that Enopian was a son of Dionys and learned from his father the art of making wine. And to each one of his other generals, the Cretans say, he made a present of an island or a city, Lemnos to Thoas, Cernus to Aeneas, Peperethos to Staphylus, Marinea to Euanthes, Poros to Alcaeus, Delos to Anion, and to Andreas the island which was named after him Andros. Moreover, because of his very great justice, the myth has sprung up that he was appointed to be judge in Hades, 
where his decisions separate the good from the wicked. And the same honour has also been attained by Minos, because he ruled wholly in accordance with law and paid the greatest heed to justice. The third brother, Sarpedon, we are told, crossed over into Asia with an army and subdued the regions about Lycia. Euandrus, his son, succeeded him in the kingship in Lycia, and marrying Dedemea, the daughter of Bellerophon, he begat that Sarpedon who took part in the expedition against Troy, although some writers have called him a son of Zeus. Minos' sons, they say, were Deucalion and Molus, and to Deucalion was born Idomeneus and to Molus was born Meriones. These two joined with Agamemnon in the expedition against Ilium with ninety ships, when they had returned in safety to their fatherland they died and were accorded a notable burial and immortal honours. And the Cretans point out their tomb at Gnosis, which bears the following inscription, Behold Idomeneus the Gnosian's tomb. And by his side am I, Meriones, the son of Molus. These two the Cretans hold in special honour as heroes of renown offering up sacrifices to them and calling upon them to come to their aid in the perils which arise in war. But now that we have examined these matters it remains for us to discuss the peoples who have become intermixed with the Cretans. That the first inhabitants of the island were known as Etiocretans, and that they are considered to have sprung from the soil itself, we have stated before, and many generations after them Pelasgians, who were in movement by reason of their continuous expeditions and migrations, arrived at Crete and made their home in a part of the island. The third people to cross over to the island, we are told, were Dorians, under the leadership of Tectimus the son of Doruz, and the account states that the larger number of these Dorians was gathered from the regions about Olympus, but that a part of them consisted of Achaeans from Laconia, since Doruz had fixed the base of his expedition in the region about Cape Malia. A fourth people to come to Crete and to become intermixed with the Cretans, we are told, was a heterogeneous collection of barbarians who in the course of time adopted the language of the native Greeks. But after these events Minos and Radamanthes, when they had attained to power, gathered the peoples on the island into one union. And last of all, after the return of the Heraclidae, Argives and Lacedaemonians sent forth colonies which they established on certain other islands and likewise took possession of Crete, and on these islands they colonized certain cities, with regard to these cities, however, we shall give a detailed account in connection with the period of time to which they belong. And since the greatest number of writers who have written about Crete disagree among themselves, there should be no occasion for surprise if what we report should not agree with every one of them, we have, indeed, followed as our authorities those who give the more probable account and are the most trustworthy, in some matters depending upon Epimenides who has written about the gods, in others upon Dociades, Sosocrates, and Laosthenides. Now that we have discussed the subject of Crete at sufficient length, we shall undertake at this point to speak about Lesbos. This island has been inhabited in ancient times by many peoples, since it has been the scene of many migrations. The first people to seize it, while it was still uninhabited, was the Pelasgians, and in the following manner, Xanthus, the son of Triopar, who was king of the Pelasgians of Argos, seized a portion of Lycia, and, making his home there, at the outset he became king over the Pelasgians who had accompanied him, but later he crossed over to Lesbos, which was uninhabited, and divided the land among the folk, and he named the island which had formerly been called Issa, Pelasgia after. The people who had settled it. And seven generations later, after the flood of Deucalion had taken place and much of mankind had perished, it came to pass that Lesbos was also laid desolate by the deluge of waters. And after these events Macarius came to the island. And, recognizing the beauty of the land, he made his home in it. This Macarius was the son of Cronacus, the son of Zeus, as he should, and certain any other poet state, and was a native of Olenus in what was then called Ias, but is now called Achaia. The folk with him had been gathered from here and there. Some being Ionians and the rest those who had streamed to him from every sort of people. Now at first Macarius made his home in Lesbos, but later, as his power kept steadily increasing because of the fertility of the island and also of his own fairness and sense of justice, he won for himself the neighbouring islands and portioned out the land, which was uninhabited. And it was during this time that Lesbos, the son of Lapiths, the son of Aeolus, the son of Hippotes, in obedience to an oracle of Pytho, sailed with colonists to the island we are discussing, and, marrying Methymna, the daughter of Macarius, he made his home there with her, and when he became a man of renown, he named the island Lesbos after himself and called the folk lesbians. And there was born to Macarius, in addition to other daughters, Mytilene and Methymna, from whom the cities in the island got their names. Moreover, 
Macarius, essaying to bring under his control the neighboring islands, dispatched a colony to Chios first of all, entrusting the leadership of the colony to one of his own sons, and after this he dispatched another son, Sidralos by name, to Samos, where he settled, and after portioning out the island in allotments to the colonists he became king over it. The third island he settled was Kos, and he appointed Neandrus to be its king, and then he dispatched Lucipus, together with a large body of colonists, to Rhodes, and the inhabitants of Rhodes received them gladly, because there was a lack of men among them, and they dwelt together as one people on the island. The mainland opposite the islands, we find, had suffered great and terrible misfortunes, in those times, because of the floods. Thus, since the fruits were destroyed over a long period by reason of the deluge, there was a dearth of the necessities of life and a pestilence prevailed among the cities because of the corruption of the air. The islands, on the other hand, since they were exposed to the breeze and supplied the inhabitants with wholesome air, and since they also enjoyed good crops, were filled with greater and greater abundance, and they quickly made the inhabitants objects of envy. Consequently, they have been given the name Islands of the Blessed, the abundance they enjoy of good things constituting the reason for the epithet. But there are some who say that they were given the name Islands of the Blessed, Macarioi, after Macarius, since his sons were the rulers over them. And, speaking generally, the islands we have mentioned have enjoyed a felicity far surpassing that of their neighbours. Not only in ancient times, but also in our own age, for being as they the finest of all in richness of soil, excellence of location, and mildness of climate, it is with good reason that they are called, what in truth, they are, blessed. As for Macarius himself, while he was king of Lesbos, he issued a law which contributed much to the common good. And he called the law the Lion, giving it this name after the strength and courage of that beast. When a considerable time had elapsed after the settlement of Lesbos, the island known as Tenedos came to be inhabited in somewhat the following manner. Tens was a son of sickness, who had been king of Colon in the Trode, and was a man who had gained renown because of his high achievements. Gathering together colonists and using as his base the mainland opposite to it, he seized an uninhabited island called Leucophrys, this island he portioned out in allotments among his followers, and he founded a city on it which he named Tenedos after himself. And since he governed uprightly and conferred many benefactions upon the inhabitants, during his lifetime he was in high favour, and upon his death he was granted immortal honours, for they built for him a sacred precinct and honoured him with sacrifices as though he were a god, and these sacrifices they have continued to perform down to modern times. But we must not omit to mention what the myths of the Tenedians have to tell about Tens, the founder of the city. Sickness his father, they say, giving credence to the unjust slanders of his wife, put his son Tens in a chest and cast it into the sea, this chest was borne along by the waves and brought to shore on Tenedos, and since Tens had been saved alive in this astonishing fashion by the providence of some one of the gods, he became king of the island, and becoming distinguished by reason of the justice he displayed and his other virtues. He was granted immortal honours. But it had happened, when his stepmother was slandering him, that a certain flute player had borne false witness against him, and so the Tenedians passed a law that no flute player should ever enter his sacred precinct. And when Tens was slain by Achilles in the course of the Trojan War, on the occasion when the Greeks sacked Tenedos, the Tenedians passed a law that no man should ever pronounce the name of Achilles in the sacred precinct of the founder of their city. Such, then, is the account which the myths give regarding Tenedos and its ancient inhabitants. Since we have set forth the facts concerning the most notable islands, we shall now give an account of the smaller ones. While in ancient times the Cyclades were still uninhabited, Minos, the son of Zeus and Europe, who was king of Crete and possessed great forces both land and naval, was master of the sea and sent forth from Crete many colonies, and he settled the greater number of the Cyclades, portioning the islands out in allotments among the folk, and he seized no small part of the coast of Asia. And this circumstance explains why harbours on the islands as well as on the coast of Asia have the same designation as those of Crete, being called Minoan. The power of Minos advanced to great heights, and having his brother Radamanthes as co-ruler, he envied him because of his fame for righteousness, and wishing to get Radamanthes out of the way he sent him off to the farthest parts of his dominion. Radamanthes went to the islands which lie off Ionia and Caria, spending his time upon them, and caused Erythrus to found the city which bears his name in Asia, while he established Enopian, the son of Minos daughter Ariadne, as lord of Chios. Now these events took place before the Trojan War, and after Troy was taken the Carian steadily increased their power and became masters of the sea, 
and taking possession of the Cyclades, some of the islands they appropriated to themselves, expelling the Cretans who had their homes on them, but in some islands they settled jointly with the Cretans who had been the first to dwell there. And at a later time, when the power of the Greeks increased, the major number of the Cyclades came to be inhabited by them. And the Carians, who were non-Greeks, were driven out of them. But of these matters, we shall give a detailed account in connection with the appropriate period of time.